R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 4, Chapters 8 through 11. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 8 The Last Council of War. Not yet, Longstreet's answer bespoke his chief's mind. As long as there was a prospect of escape, Lee felt it was his duty to fight on. He would not yield one hour before he must. But might it be possible, on the basis of Grant's letter, to negotiate an honorable peace? Might Grant be willing to do now what he had refused to do a month before, confer and see if a way could be found to end the slaughter? Perhaps the chance was remote, but if there was a chance, Lee must avail himself of it. He could not assume, in Grant's words, the responsibility of any further effusion of blood. With no reply to Longstreet, he took a single sheet of cheap, ruled note paper that bore a raised watermark in the upper left-hand corner and wrote this answer. 7th APL 65. G-E-N-L. I have R-E-C-D your note of this date. Though not entertaining the opinion you express of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of N in Virginia, I reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood, and therefore, before considering your proposition, ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender. Very respire your OBT. Served. R. E. Lee. G. E. N. L. Lieutenant G. N. L. U. S. Grant. Come armies of the U, states one. Lee sent this reply promptly and did not show it to Longstreet, or, so far as is recorded, to anyone else, though the nature of the message from Grant was guessed if its purport was not actually known. Within an hour after the flag of truce had been met, the answer had been presented on the lines to the waiting staff officer, who was none other than Lee's old friend and former adjacent at West Point, Seth Williams, Grant's inspector general. The wagons had passed on now and had halted in the neighborhood of New Store, close to the southwestern edge of Buckingham County, nearly 20 miles from Farmville, but they were much scattered because of the wretched road and jaded condition of the animals. Broken down caissons and wagons were abandoned and sometimes were not even pulled out of the road before they were fired. The troops who still carried their muskets had hardly the appearance of soldiers as they wearily tramped along, their clothes all tattered and covered with mud, their eyes sunken and lusterless, and their faces pale and pinched from their ceaseless march. Many of the men who had thrown away their arms and knapsacks were lying prone on the ground along the roadside, too much exhausted to march further, and only waiting for the enemy to come and pick them up as prisoners, while at short intervals there were wagons mired down, their teams of horses and mules lying in the mud from which they had struggled to extricate themselves until complete exhaustion had forced them to be still and wait for death to glaze their wildly starting eyes, and still. Their quick gasping and panting for the breath, which could scarcely reach some of them through the mud that almost closed their nostrils, but through all this a part of the army still trudged on, with their faith still strong, and only waiting for General Lee to say whether they were to face about and fight. With straggling as it was, and with the enemy known to be close on his heels, Lee deemed it desirable to send ahead Gordon's tired men and the various scattered units and to bring from Van to rear the corps of Longstreet, which had suffered less and was in fair fighting condition. Nothing was left of the infantry now but the starved remnant of these two corps and a few small brigades kept together by the spirit of their officers and the persistence of their morale. By 11 p.m. Gordon's men had passed up the road toward Lynchburg and Longstreet resumed the march. The cavalry closed the rear, kept there because the immediate danger from the troops following them was greater at that time than that from any force that might be moving parallel to the route of the retreat. At 1 a.m., from New Store, the wagons started again. It was now Saturday, April 8, the beginning of the sixth day after the evacuation of Petersburg. Lee's objective remained the same, Danville and Union with Johnson, but his hope of attaining that objective had dwindled until now it hung on a double contingency. The meandering Appomattox River along the line of Lee's retreat was narrowing fast. A few miles more of the march and the river would cease to be a protective barrier against that part of Grant's army moving south of the stream and parallel to Lee. Beyond the headwaters of the Appomattox, across a watershed to the west, lay the James River, with Lynchburg at the nearest point of Lee's approach. This watershed was about 12 miles wide. 
Directly over it ran the Southside Railroad, on which were the provision trains that had been sent from Lynchburg, as well as the cars that had been hurried from Farmville on the Federal's approach. If, therefore, Lee was to escape, he had to cross the watershed between the Appomattox and the James before the enemy got there and closed the way. And if he was to keep his army from literal starvation, he had to meet at some point on the railroad over that watershed the trains of provisions that were being moved to meet him. The most convenient place to reach the trains was where the road of his march crossed the railway at a station called After the County and the River Appomattox. The terrain was as shown in the sketch on page 108. Would Lee reach Appomattox Station before the Federals and would he procure food there or nearby? If he did, he might fed the men, turn south and even yet reach Danville and join General Johnston. But if he found the Federals across the watershed in sufficient strength to block his advance and to seize his provisions, that was the end. James River would then cut off his retreat. There could be nothing beyond that point, no alternative to which, as in the past, he could turn quickly if his chosen plan had to be laid aside. Lee had no way of judging that morning precisely what were the chances of reaching Appomattox Station and of getting his provisions. General St. John had started out for Danville on the 7th and had made a wide circuit ahead of the army in order to avoid the Federals. At Pamplin Station, 18 miles west of Farmville, he had found the cars sent up from Farmville. He thought they should go farther west and he communicated with General Lee. But the situation was so uncertain that Lee had not been willing to send them on toward Lynchburg. Perhaps he decided not to have these rations sent westward because he intended to halt at Appomattox Courthouse the supplies sent down from Lynchburg. With supplies both at Appomattox and at Pamplin's he stood a better chance of feeding the men. As for the possibility of marching to Appomattox before the Federals could close the way, that depended on how many of the enemy were pursuing on the north side of the river and how many were moving and at what speed on the south side by a somewhat shorter route. The Confederate Intelligence Service had broken down with the rest of the staff. None of the cavalry was ahead. Lee had no means of ascertaining the grim truth that two Union Corps were now on the North Bank, following him closely, while the Cavalry Corps, the V, the Zix, and part of the XXV were hurrying forward, unencumbered by wagons and weak horses, in an effort to beat him to Appomattox Station. Toward that point the march continued slowly through bright sunshine during the morning hours of the 8th. The Federals in the rear did not push the cavalry. The infantry were only a little disturbed on the left flank, and they're only by horsemen. Lee's manner was as composed as ever, and when he received the salute of a cavalry command he passed, it was, as one officer wrote, with a calm smile that assured us our confidence was not misplaced. The situation was so quiet that General Lee halted during the forenoon and stretched himself out on the ground to rest. While he was there, General Pendleton approached and told him that a number of his officers had met the previous evening and had considered the situation. They had concluded that the army could not cut its way through the Federals or disband and reassemble, and that, consequently, further bloodshed would be futile. They had deputized Pendleton to acquaint Lee with their deliberations and to tell him that, in their opinion, he ought to stop the fighting and open negotiations for the surrender of the army. Pendleton did not say so, but the officers had acted in a desire to save Lee the humiliation of making the first move toward surrender. They were willing to assume the responsibility of advising that course if thereby they might relieve him. Lee did not like the suggestion. What he answered is a matter of dispute. Early writers quoted him as saying, Surrender? I have too many good fighting men for that. Pendleton stated that Lee replied substantially, I trust it has not come to that. We certainly have too many brave men to think of laying down our arms. They still fight with great spirit, whereas the enemy does not. And, besides, if I were to intimate to General Grant that I would listen to terms, he would at once regard it as such an evidence of weakness that he would demand an unconditional surrender and sooner than that I am resolved to die. Indeed, we must all determine to die at our posts. The manner must have been sterner than the words, for when General Pendleton talked of the interview shortly after it ended, he had the air of a man who had been decidedly snubbed and was embarrassed to have to tell of it. Longstreet and Gordon had not attended the conference nor did they share the opinion of those for whom Pendleton spoke. 
Longstreet stated that when he was asked to broach to General Lee the subject of surrender, he refused with a sharp reminder that in proposing such action the officers were violating the Articles of War and were liable to court-martial. The day wore on, with less of incident than any since the retreat had begun. During the early afternoon word came from Fitz Lee that his rear guard was about two miles behind him. Only infantry was pursuing him, he said, and they were of the two corps. The Federal cavalry had probably gone to the Confederate left, had not he better leave a cavalry picket on the road and come forward with his troops? Some two hours later a further dispatch from Fitz Lee brought news that the enemy's cavalry had reached Prospect Station, 20 miles east of Appomattox. They would arrive at Appomattox by 10 a.m. of the 9th at the earliest. Rooney Lee and Gary should push on to Appomattox, Fitz Lee wrote. He would come forward himself as quickly as he could get past the column. If this was a correct forecast, the race to Appomattox would be close. The enemy's cavalry and the Confederate advance would get there within a few hours of each other. During the same afternoon of the dragging march toward Appomattox there disappeared from Confederate command an officer who had played no small part on the bloody stage of Northern Virginia. Throughout the operations from March 29 onward, despair had seemed to dominate the heart of Richard H. Anderson, fighting Dick. As already indicated, he nowhere had fought with his old vigor. After the action at Sailor's Creek he had spent the seventh trying, as he said, to get together the fragments of his command. While he had been looking for Pickett, that officer had been searching for him and, at length, had rejoined Longstreet with a handful of men, only about sixty of whom, as he subsequently reported, had muskets when the end came. These survivors were assigned to Mahone. After Wise had collected what was left of Johnson's division, the largest of Anderson's units, it was attached to Grimes's division of Gordon's corps. Thus was Anderson left without a command, and on the afternoon of the 8th he was formally relieved and notified that he could return to his home, or any other place he might select, and report thence to the Secretary of War. The specific reasons for Lee's action were not given, whether he thought Anderson disqualified for further command because of his despair, or whether he considered him culpable for what had happened at Sailor's Creek. Whatever the cause, Anderson did not dispute the action. After the war, in a personal struggle of the bitterest sort against poverty, he remained on friendly terms with his old chief. At the same time that Lee relieved Anderson of command, he took the same action regarding Pickett and Bushrod Johnson, but the order regarding Pickett apparently never reached him. As late as April 11, he signed himself, Major G.N.L. Comge. Lee thought the order had been given Pickett, and when he saw him later, he is said to have remarked, I thought that man was no longer with the army. About dark, Lee received another note from Grant. It had been passed through the lines before noon but had been delayed in reaching General Lee. It came sealed, its contents not known to those who handled it, and was an answer to Lee's request of the previous evening for a statement of Grant's terms. With the aid of a wax taper that Colonel Venable lighted, Lee quietly read the paper. Grant stated, in simple terms, that as peace was his great desire, the only condition on which he would insist would be that the officers and men who were surrendered should be disqualified to bear arms until properly exchanged. Grant added that he would meet Lee, or, he offered thoughtfully, would designate officers to meet others named by Lee to arrange the terms for the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee said nothing for a few moments. Then he asked Colonel Venable, how would you answer that? I would answer no such letter, Venable asked. Ah, but it must be answered, Lee said. Lee was not willing to consider surrender, but the hope of a general settlement that had shaped his action on receipt of Grant's first letter did not seem wholly destroyed by Grant's language. It might not be impossible to make honorable terms for all the Confederate forces. So, from the roadside where the message reached him, on a sheet similar to the one he had used the night before, Lee wrote in his own hand this letter, of which Colonel Marshall took a copy on a bit of scrap paper. 8H APL 65 GENL I RECD at a late hour your note of today. In mine of yesterday, I did not intend to propose the surrender of the Army of N in Virginia, but to ask the terms of your proposition. 
To be frank, I do not think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender of this army, but as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all, I desired to know whether your proposals would lead to that, and I cannot therefore meet you with a view to surrender the army of N in Virginia, but as far as your proposal may affect the C.S. forces under my command and tend to the restoration of peace, I shall be pleased to meet you at 10 a.m. tomorrow on the old stage road to Richmond between the picket lines of the two armies. Very respire OBT Seft. R. E. Lee. G. E. N. L. Lieutenant G. N. L. U. S. Grant. Com. Armies of the U. S. This letter was delivered to General Humphrey's lines, beyond the Confederate rearguard. Before it was dispatched, the leading brigades of Gordon's command, very weary, had halted at 3 p.m. about one mile from Appomattox Courthouse. Ahead of Gordon were surplus wagons and, beyond the courthouse, the artillery under General R. L. Walker that had been started from Amelia Courthouse on the 4th and had now been overtaken. Longstreet's corps stopped behind Gordon about nightfall, his rearguard six miles from the courthouse. Lee and his staff turned out from the road into thick woods with Longstreet and his officers and made his camp on the left of the highway, about two miles from the courthouse. Lee's ambulance and the headquarters wagons were entangled somewhere among the trains. There were no tents, no tables, no camp stools, no cooking utensils, and practically no food. The moon was now up and the air was chill, though the day had been warm for the season. A fire was lighted. Lee and the others sat around it on the ground. About nine o'clock there came a sudden roar of artillery from the front where, until that time, all had been quiet. The sound probably was heard at Lee's headquarters and told its own story. If it was not heard, what had happened was soon written on the skies. For against the clouds, in front as well as in rear and on the left flank, the light of campfires was reflected. And soon there came confirmation in messages from the front. The enemy was across the line of the army's advance over the watershed. Federal troops had come up from the south and had attacked and had captured some of the surplus artillery as well as the wagon train of Rooney Lee's division. Although this news might mean the extinction of the last spark of hope, Lee received it so quietly that none of those who were with him that evening recorded what he said in comment. He sent orders to Fitz Lee to pass the cavalry to the front and directed him to report in person at headquarters. The rearguard, left without cavalry, proceeded to dig and to man field works across the road of the federal pursuit. Ere long Fitzley arrived, as did Gordon, on a like summons. With these and with Longstreet began Lee's last council of war. The commander stood by the fire. Longstreet sat on a log, smoking his pipe. Gordon and Fitzley stretched themselves out on a blanket. Staff officers and perhaps some of the brigade and division commanders sat nearby but not within earshot. Lee explained the condition of affairs as far as he knew it and read to his chiefs of corps the correspondence with Grant. What, he then asked, did they advise him to do? 47. There could, of course, be only one answer for men who were determined to fight as long as any hope remained. That answer was to attack as soon as possible, to attempt to cut a way through, and, if successful, to resume the march. Should it be found that the troops ahead were only cavalry, Fitzlee's men could charge them, with Gordon in support, and could clear the road for the rest of the soldiers. But if the Federal infantry had outmarched the weary survivors of the Army of Northern Virginia and stood in force across the road, too strong to be driven, the troops would then be virtually surrounded and only one thing remained to be done, surrender. The word could not be avoided now. From this decision, reached without heroics, there was no dissent. Details were worked out quickly. The advance was to begin at 1 a.m. Fitzlee was to drive the enemy from his front, wheel to the left, and cover the passage of the trains, which were to be reduced to two battalions of artillery and the ammunition wagons. Gordon was then to move ahead, and Longstreet was to close up and be ready to repel any attack by the forces moving on the Confederate rear. The route was to be via Campbell Courthouse and Pittsylvania, and not by Lynchburg, on which a separate federal column was moving along the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, and from which all provisions had been sent to meet General Lee's advance. The surplus wagons, however, were to go toward Lynchburg on the bare chance that they might escape while the enemy was pursuing the army. The orders were given. The conference was ended. 
Hope had seemed lost half a dozen times, only to find through Lee's resourcefulness something new on which to fix itself. Hope had sustained the army on all that dreadful march. Hope was now reduced to the possibility that only Union cavalry and none of the blue-coated infantry stood in the way. Yet, though the army was merely the ghost of other days, somehow that hope would not down altogether. Gordon and Fitz Lee rode off. Longstreet prepared to make his bed on the ground, with his saddle for his pillow and the saddle blanket for his covering. Something as nearly approaching peace as ever there comes in war was about to settle over the bivouac among the trees when one of Gordon's staff officers returned to explain that his chief had neglected to ask where he was to halt and camp the next night, as though it were certain he would break through and resume the march. Did General Lee have any directions for him on this point? Yes, said Lee firmly. Tell General Gordon I should be glad for him to halt just beyond the Tennessee line, some 175 miles away. It was then about midnight, the beginning of one of the three or four most memorable dates in American history, April 9, 1865, Sunday, Palm Sunday. And the oaks in the forest were tasseling in rebirth. Chapter 9, The Ninth of April during the night, after the vanguard was moved forward to meet anticipated attack, the reflection of the campfires on the clouds and the mutter of moving men indicated the massing of a large force on the Confederate front and left. Lee, with his usual care, reasoned that this might call for a change in the plan that had been worked out at the council a few hours before, so he ordered the chief of the cavalry corps to feel out the strength of the enemy and, if need be, to suspend his advance until daylight, when he could better ascertain the situation. Then Lee sought a little sleep. Shortly after one o'clock, from the road nearby, there came the weary staccato of the march. It was not noisy, for the men were too tired and too depressed to indulge in banter. So nearly silent were the passing troops that it was impossible to tell to what command they belonged. But presently through the darkness came a voice and a scrap of doggerel. The race is not to them that's got the longest legs to run nor the battle to that people. That shoots the biggest gun. The intonation was unmistakable, and the words were familiar in the army as part of the so-called Texas Bible. The elocutionist who was reciting the lines for his solace must be a member of the famous Old Hood's Brigade of the First Corps. Longstreet's men evidently were going forward unseen to close the rear in the final attempt to break through. If General Lee heard the soldier, as at least one other at his bivouac did, he may have remembered how he had written Mrs. Lee in kindred, if nobler words, when the last federal offensive was in the making, trusting to a merciful God, who does not always give the battle to the strong, I pray we may not be overwhelmed. I shall endeavor to do my duty and fight to the last. Soon the groups among the trees were all awake. The younger men stirred up the fire and, from a single tin cup, performed their toilet and ate, in turn, a gruel of meal and water that each mixed and warmed over the burning sticks. General Lee dressed himself faultlessly and put on his handsomest sword and his sash of deep, red silk, but he was not seen eating any breakfast. Perhaps he had none. I have probably to be General Grant's prisoner and thought I must make my best appearance," he later told General Pendleton when that officer came up and expressed his surprise at Lee's attire. Lee thoughtfully urged the artillerist to get some rest and in the morning to be guided by circumstances. Then, about three o'clock, Lee started to the front, where already the guns were announcing Gordon's preparations for an advance. Lee had not far to go, for what was left of the Army of Northern Virginia was now on and alongside a single road, the van not more than four miles, at that hour, from the rear guard. He had less than 8,000 armed infantry left in the ranks, though other thousands, too exhausted to bear them, had stuck their guns into the ground with the bayonets and were dragging slowly about, looking for food, or were hanging to the wagons, now reduced by capture and loss to 744. Gordon's Corps, 7,500 on March 25th, was now about 2,000. Field's division, the largest in the army and the one that had sustained the least fighting on the retreat, had present for duty only 3,865 of an aggregate present and absent of 11,017. The number of Field's men reported absent in C.S. lines that day, 4,497, was larger than the number present for duty. Pickett had only about 60 armed men, though he subsequently reported about 740 others present at Appomattox without their muskets. The artillerists were 2,073 officers and men, with 61 guns and 13 caissons. 
These had an average of 93 rounds of ammunition, which the chief ordnance officer reported were the sole dependence in the state of Virginia. The cavalry were between 2,100 and 2,400. As Fitzley had availed himself of the discretion the commanding general had given him and had delayed his advance until nearly daylight, it was five o'clock when the attack opened, about half a mile west of the courthouse. When Lee arrived in rear of Gordon's command the battle was on, the artillery was in action, and the countryside was echoing with volleys that must have sounded much more like those of infantry than like those of cavalry. There was a fog, however, that concealed the landscape, though Lee was on high ground. The course of the action could not be seen. Lee waited until perhaps eight o'clock, and then, as the sound of battle was not receding and no word had come from Gordon, he sent Colonel Venable to study the situation and to ask what might be expected. Venable found that this had happened, Gordon had gone forward, had passed through the village of Appomattox Courthouse, and had soon found a breastwork across the road with Federals behind it. He had not known whether they were foot or dismounted horse, but after a short pause, he had attacked, with the cavalry on his right and with the skeleton divisions of Johnson, Grimes, Evans, and Walker in order to the center and left. They had echeloned by the right flank, had advanced quickly, had driven the enemy, had captured two guns, had cleared the road, and then had wheeled by the left flank into line of battle to cover the passage of the wagons, as Lee had directed. Scarcely had this been done than the cavalry had discovered a heavy force of infantry concealed in a woodland in rear of Gordon's right flank. The infantry had soon moved, with Union troopers in support, against the Confederate cavalry connecting with Gordon's right and had driven the mounted Confederates back. The enemy in the wood, speedily identified as infantry, had advanced by the left flank in the direction of the courthouse. The Federals' purpose seemed to be to close on Gordon's rear and to cut him off from Longstreet, who had now come up as far as the crowded condition of the road permitted, and was on the other side of the Appomattox, a small stream at that point. Simultaneously with this move on the Confederate right, the enemy's cavalry had moved toward Gordon's left and had begun to envelop that flank. General Long and Colonel Thomas Carter with their guns had been able to hold up this advance until General Evans could about face part of his command and go to meet the approaching bluecoats, go, ominously enough, in the direction exactly opposite that of the original advance. This was the situation explained to Venable. He surveyed it hastily and soon was back with Gordon's report of it, tell General Lee, Gordon said, I have fought my corps to a frazzle, and I fear I can do nothing unless I am heavily supported by Longstreet's corps. Lee heard in silence this report, which was the more conclusive because Gordon was one of the most daring leaders in the Army of Northern Virginia. If Gordon could do nothing, unless heavily supported by Longstreet's corps, which was already holding off two corps on Lee's rear, then. Then, said Lee, oblivious to the presence of his staff officers about him, there is nothing left me to do but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. His words meant the end. When Lee, the resourceful, the ever-striking, saw nothing ahead but surrender, who else could cherish hope longer? Restraint was broken under the weight of the tragedy. Men spoke in the grief of their hearts. Oh, General, said someone who doubtless had proudly fed his soul on the thought that the Confederates, like Washington and his comrades in arms, had been writing the story of a new nation, oh, General, what will history say of the surrender of the army in the field? Yes, answered Lee, simply, I know they will say hard things of us, they will not understand how we were overwhelmed by numbers. But that is not the question, Colonel, the question is, is it right to surrender this army? If it is right, then I will take all the responsibility. But he did not take it as calmly as his brave answer indicated. He looked over the field, about the time the fog was lifting, and he exclaimed as though he were tempted to a desperate act, how easily I could be rid of this, and be at rest. I have only to ride along the line, and all will be over. His voice was almost hopeless, and he was scarcely able to control his feelings, but he stopped and gripped himself and, after an inward struggle, said with a deep sigh, but it is our duty to live. What will become of the women and children of the South if we are not here to protect them? After a little, he sent a messenger for Longstreet, and, by a dying fire of fence rails, he waited for Old Pete to arrive. When Longstreet rode up, Lee saluted him, but he had a look of deep depression that Longstreet observed. 
Lee told the chief of the First Corps how matters stood, with Gordon blocked, no food at hand and the rear guard facing a large part of Meade's army, and he ended with the statement that he did not think it was possible to get on. What was Longstreet's view? It was quickly given in a counter-question, would the sacrifice of the Army of Northern Virginia help the cause elsewhere? Lee did not think so. Then, answered Longstreet, your situation speaks for itself. Mahone was nearby, shivering. Lee asked for his opinion. Mahone stirred up the fire and took pains to explain that he was a tremble because he was cold rather than scared. After a number of questions, he stated the same conclusion as Longstreet. Soon Alexander appeared. Lee called to him, walked over to a felled oak, peeled off the bark, sat down, took out his map from his breast pocket and said to the young chief of artillery of the First Corps, who had not yet learned of Gordon's plight or of Lee's decision, well, we have come to the junction, and they seem to be here ahead of us. What have we got to do today? Alexander answered that the men of the First Corps were still in condition to fight and were ready to do their part if Lee saw fit to try and cut his way through the Federals. I have left only two divisions, Fields and Mahones, sufficiently organized to be relied upon, Lee answered. All the rest have been broken and routed and can do little good. Those divisions are now scarcely 4,000 apiece, and that is far too little to meet the force now in our front. Thereupon Alexander proposed, as an alternative to surrender, that the men take to the woods with their arms, under orders to report to governors of their respective states. What would you hope to accomplish by that? Lee queried. It might prevent the surrender of the other armies, Alexander argued, because if the Army of Northern Virginia laid down its arms, all the others would follow suit, whereas, if the men reported to the governors, each state would have a chance of making an honorable peace. Besides, Alexander went on, the men had a right to ask that they be spared the humiliation of asking terms of Grant, only to be told that U.S. unconditional surrender Grant would live up to the name he had earned at Fort Donelson and at Vicksburg. Lee saw such manifest danger in this proposal to become guerrillas that he began to question Alexander, if I should take your advice, how many men do you suppose would get away? Two-thirds of us. We would be like rabbits and partridges in the bushes, and they could not scatter to follow us. I have not over 15,000 muskets left, Lee explained. Two-thirds of them divided among the states, even if all could be collected, would be too small a force to accomplish anything. All could not be collected. Their homes have been overrun, and many would go to look after their families. Then, General, he reasoned further, you and I as Christian men have no right to consider only how this would affect us. We must consider its effect on the country as a whole. Already it is demoralized by the four years of war. If I took your advice, the men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would be compelled to rob and steal in order to live. They would become mere bands of marauders, and the enemy's cavalry would pursue them and overrun many sections they may never have occasion to visit. We would bring on a state of affairs it would take the country years to recover from. And, as for myself, you young fellows might go bushwhacking, but the only dignified course for me would be to go to General Grant and surrender myself and take the consequences of my acts. Lee paused, and then he added, outwardly hopeful, on the strength of Grant's letter of the previous night, whatever his inward misgivings, but I can tell you one thing for your comfort. Grant will not demand an unconditional surrender. He will give us as good terms as this army has the right to demand, and I am going to meet him in the rear at 10 a.m. and surrender the army on the condition of not fighting again until exchanged. Alexander went away, a humbler man. I had not a single word to say in reply, he wrote years afterwards. He had answered my suggestion from a plane so far above it that I was ashamed of having made it. It was soon after General Lee had been talking to Longstreet and to Mahone that his adjutant reported. Taylor had returned to the army on the 3D after his marriage in Richmond the preceding night and he had been busy with a thousand duties on the train. The evening before he had been sent off to park the trains and he had just now rejoined the headquarters staff. Well, Colonel, said Lee, in his usual formula, what are we to do? Taylor expressed the belief that if they rid themselves of the trains, they might still escape. Yes, said Lee, perhaps we could, but I have had a conference with these gentlemen around me and they agree that the time has come for capitulation. 
Well, sir, I can only speak for myself, to me any other fate is preferable. Such is my individual way of thinking, Lee broke in. But, Taylor added, of course, General, it is different with you, you had to think of these brave men and decide not only for yourself but for them. Yes, replied Lee, it would be useless and therefore cruel to provoke the further effusion of blood, and I have arranged to meet General Grant with a view to surrender and wish you to accompany me. Lee seems to have unburdened himself somewhat by talking in this frank manner with his associates in arms, but he was still abstracted and manifestly sick at heart when he mounted Traveller at 8.30 or about that time. He was going to meet Grant, and if the Federal Chief was not willing to discuss a general peace, then Lee would have to ask terms for the Army of Northern Virginia alone. Those terms were not to be negotiated, if his adversary so willed, they could be imposed. The rendezvous that Lee had set with Grant, in his note of the previous evening, was on the old state road, between the picket lines. It was in that direction he now went, accompanied by Taylor, Marshall, and Sergeant Tucker, chief courier of the Third Corps. They passed along the road where Longstreet's corps had halted, for the last time in its famous career, because it had found the way ahead blocked by the wagon train that had stopped when Gordon's advance had encountered the enemy in superior force. Soon the four riders came to a stout breastwork of logs that the Confederate rearguard had erected across and on either side of the road to hold off the Federals, whose appearance was expected at any time. The men recognized Lee and cheered him as he passed through their line. The courier then went ahead with his white flag. Marshall and Taylor followed, and, a little behind them, Lee. It was, as far as the records show, the first time during the war between the states that Lee personally had ever appeared for any purpose under a flag of truce. The little group of horsemen had gone a little more than half a mile and had just turned a bend in the road when they saw a line of federal skirmishers approaching them. Marshall immediately went out in the expectation of meeting General Grant and his staff. Instead, after a little, the skirmishers halted and a single Union officer and his flag-bearer came forward. The officer proved to be Lt. Col. Charles A. Whittier, Assistant Adjutant General on the staff of Major General A. A. Humphreys, commander of the two corps. Col. Whittier had no verbal message from General Grant and no instructions to conduct the party to a meeting place. Instead, he merely brought a letter, which he delivered. He would wait, he said, in case Lee wished to send an answer. Marshall jogged back and gave the dispatch to Lee, who opened it and read as follows. Headquarters Armies of the United States April 9, 1865 General R. E. Lee Commanding C. S. Armies General, your note of yesterday is received. As I have no authority to treat on the subject of peace, the meeting proposed for 10 a.m. today could lead to no good. I will state, however, General, that I am equally anxious for peace with yourself, and the whole North entertain the same feeling. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. By the South laying down their arms, they will hasten that most desirable event, save thousands of human lives, and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed. Sincerely hoping that all our difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life, I subscribe myself. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. U. S. Grant. Lieutenant General, U. S. Army 38. There was not to be even the poor comfort of an approach to the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia through a discussion of peace on all the fronts. The humiliation must be complete. Lee had to make a formal and unqualified offer to yield up the arms of his men. But he did not hesitate a moment. Having concluded that it was his duty to prevent further bloodshed in his army, he faced that duty precisely as he met any other, in a determination to do his best for the soldiers, without any evasion or attempt to shield himself. He bade Colonel Marshall get out pencil and paper so that he could dictate a note in which he would try to ensure for the soldiers the generous terms of parole that the federal commander had offered in his note of the 8th, though Grant had not repeated them in this new letter. This omission gave Lee much concern. Disappointed that Grant had not come to meet him, he began to be apprehensive that his adversary had refused to appear because he now felt that he had the army virtually surrounded and could impose harsher conditions. Lee's misgivings may have been increased when at that very moment there came a roar of artillery from the front, as if the enemy were attacking. 
He started a reply, which Marshall took down in pencil on a broad sheet of paper, but while he was dictating there came a rush of horses' hoofs and a one-armed man in grey dashed from around the bend and went a hundred yards beyond them before he could pull in his mount. Lee knew the horses of most of his officers, and he probably had no difficulty in identifying the superb animal that now came heavily back, half dead from the wild speed to which the officer on her back had forced her. What is it? What is it? Lee cried to the soldier, whom he recognized. Oh, why did you do it? You have killed your beautiful horse. The officer, Colonel John Haskell, explained that Longstreet had dispatched him, telling him to kill his mare if need be, to say that Fitzlee had just sent word he had found a road by which the army could escape. Lee either did not credit the report or else did not believe the infantry could safely follow where the cavalry might go. He went on with his letter, which was hurriedly finished, as the sound of firing from the front grew ominously. April 9, 1865 General I received your note of this morning on the picket line whither I had come to meet you and ascertain definitely what terms were embraced in your proposal of yesterday with reference to the surrender of this army. I now request an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose. Very respectfully. Your OBT. Served. R. E. Lee. Lieutenant Genu S. Grant. Comj U. S. Armies. Lee received the text from Marshall and signed it in a large, bold hand, probably because he did not have his glasses on. He did not wait for Marshall to make a copy of this letter, but he took time to direct his secretary to express to General Grant, through Colonel Whittier, his regret at not seeing him. As Marshall carried the letter to Whittier, who was waiting a short distance away, he saw the Federal skirmishers again advancing. He knew that if they went forward they would soon strike the Confederate rear guard, and that a needless battle would occur, so he explained to Whittier the purport of the letter and told him he hoped hostilities might be suspended until the communication reached Grant. Whittier took the letter and went off, with a promise to bring an answer from his commanding general. Lee waited in the road. Probably at that time, while Whittier was within the Union lines, there came another message from the front, Fitzlee reported his previous information erroneous. There was no road by which the infantry could get away. Lee then remembered he had omitted to notify Gordon that he intended to ask for a suspension of hostilities and that he had failed to authorize him or Longstreet to send out a flag of truce, pending the surrender. It must have been by the courier who brought the second message from Fitz Lee that the commanding general sent back word to his corps commanders to seek an armistice. Colonel Whittier soon returned and said he was directed to state that the attack had been ordered and his commanding officer had no discretion but must deliver it. A letter could not reach General Grant, he explained, in time for orders to be received from him before the hour set for the attack. Marshall expressed his regret at this and asked Whittier to request his superior to read Lee's letter to General Grant, as he felt that, in the circumstances, the commanding officer might feel justified in suspending the order and in avoiding a useless sacrifice of life. Whittier disappeared again with this appeal. Lee waited with his companions. Time passed. The Federal skirmishers drew closer. A flag of truce came out from the Federal lines with a request that the Confederates withdraw, as the advance was underway and the attack was about to be delivered. It was probably through this messenger that Lee sent another note to General Grant. This, like the other, he dictated to Colonel Marshall and signed in pencil. It read, April 9, 1865. General. I ask a suspension of hostilities pending the adjustment of the terms of the surrender of this army in the interview requested in my former communication today. Very respectfully. Your OBT. Served. R. E. Lee. G. E. N. L. Lieutenant General U. S. Grant. Comj. U. S. Army. Although the Federals still came steadily forward, Lee waited under the flag of truce for an answer. Determined that not another life should be lost if he could prevent it, he remained where he was until the head of the Federal column was plainly visible not more than 100 yards away. Then came a peremptory warning that he must withdraw immediately as the advance could not be halted. 
very reluctantly and apprehensive that this meant a waste of life in another battle and harsher terms of surrender, Lee turned his horse's head and rode back up the road and through the Confederate rear guard, where he found Longstreet awaiting the Federals' attack. The wagon trains had been parked, and part of the troops from the rear of the First Corps had been moved forward and had formed a line of battle behind Gordon's command and to the east of the North Fork of the Appomattox, so that Longstreet's troops were now equally prepared for attack from in front or from behind. Lee remained near the rear of Longstreet's position until after 11 o'clock, when it seemed that the opening of the attack was only a matter of moments, though the Confederate guns were silent and the infantry were under orders not to fire. Just when it appeared certain that the action would open, Colonel Whittier appeared again under a white flag opposite Field's division. He brought a note from Meade, the text of which, unfortunately, has been lost. As far as it can be reconstructed inferentially, the note expressed agreement to an informal truce on Meade's lines for an hour and suggested that Lee might be able to communicate more quickly with Grant if he sent a duplicate of his letter through some other part of the line. With this assurance and suggestion, Lee rode back toward the front. He stopped in a small apple orchard at the foot of the hill and a short distance in advance of the line of battle that had been drawn up facing westward. From this point Lee now sent Grant his third note of the day, written, as were the others, by Colonel Marshall in pencil and signed by the General. Here it is. HDQRSANVA. April 9, 1865. General, I sent a communication to you today from the picket line whither I had gone in hopes of meeting you in pursuance of the request contained in my letter of yesterday. Major General Meade informs me that it would probably expedite matters to send a duplicate through some other part of your lines. I therefore request an interview at such time and place as you may designate to discuss the terms of the surrender of this army in accordance with your offer to have such an interview contained in your letter of yesterday. Very respectfully. Your OBT served. R. E. Lee. G. E. N. L. Lieutenant General U. S. Grant. Commander U. S. Armies. If this letter went even further than did Lee's earlier communication requesting an interview, it was because his experience of the morning had made him fearful of sterner terms and because, in the second place, the desperate situation had become so much worse that his army could easily be destroyed, no matter how dearly the men sold their lives. Unknown to the commanding general, Fitz Lee had gone off with nearly all the cavalry, determined that he would not share in the surrender. Gordon's troops had withdrawn from their advanced position and had fallen back across the North Fork of the Appomattox to rally on Longstreet. As the Federals had pressed closely in on the south and had worked around to the northwest, what was left of the Army of Northern Virginia was almost enveloped. That the enemy did not proceed to attack was due to the fact that an informal truce in front, similar to the one in the rear, had been allowed by Sheridan and Ord. Lee was very tired after the strain of the morning, and he now stretched himself out under the apple tree on a pile of fence rails that Alexander had arranged for him and had covered with blankets. From this position Lee saw some Confederate troops crossing a nearby creek, and he inquired who they were. He was told they were his engineer regiment, commanded by his young friend and former staff officer, Colonel T. M. R. Talcott. Lee sent for Talcott and told him that he considered it his duty to go to see General Grant and to stop further sacrifice of life. At Taylor's instance, as a crowd was beginning to gather, Talcott threw out a cordon around the tree. Very soon there arrived under a flag of truce Brigadier General James W. Forsyth, Sheridan's chief of staff, who came to say that the Union cavalry commander was doubtful of his authority to recognize the informal truce and wished to communicate with General Meade. As the route through the Confederate army was the shortest, he requested permission to go that way. Lee acquiesced and sent Colonel Taylor to accompany him, the Federal Assistant Adjutant General with his own A.A.G., the strictest military etiquette. To Longstreet, who came up about this time, Lee confided his fear that Grant might be disposed to demand stiffer terms, inasmuch as he had declined those offered the previous day. Longstreet did not think so. He had known Grant intimately before the war and he told his chief that the federal general would impose only such terms as Lee himself would in reverse circumstances. Lee did not seem altogether satisfied and continued to converse with Longstreet in broken sentences for some time. They were still together when Forsyth and Taylor returned from their ride to Meade's lines in the rear. 
Forsyth doubtless brought verbal assurance and may have transmitted General Meade's definite written acceptance of a truce until two o'clock. And now, about 12.15 p.m., with another flag of truce, came a single staff officer, accompanied by a Confederate escort, probably Colonel John Fairfax. He rode from the front, the direction whence Grant's messenger was expected to arrive. His mission was correctly guessed from the moment of his appearance. General, said Longstreet to Lee, as the rider approached, unless he offers us honorable terms, come back and let us fight it out. Lee said nothing, but in his bearing there was something, the prospect of another fight, perhaps, that made Longstreet think he had heartened his chief. Lee sat up as the federal officer dismounted. In the eyes of his companions he had never looked grander than at that moment. General Lee, said the officer's escort, allow me to introduce you to Colonel Babcock. Lee raised himself to his full height and bowed. Lieutenant Colonel Orville E. Babcock, a D.C., to General Grant, saluted and delivered a letter, which General Lee read, as follows. Headquarters Armies of the United States. April 9, 1865. General R. E. Lee. Commanding C. S. Army. Your note of this date is but this moment, 11.50 a.m., received. In consequence of my having passed from the Richmond and Lynchburg Road to the Farmville and Lynchburg Road, I am at this writing about four miles west of Walker's Church, and will push forward to the front for the purpose of meeting you. Notice sent on this road where you wish the interview to take place will meet me. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. U. S. Grant. Lieutenant General 62. There was at least no suggestion in this letter of other terms than those that had been offered the day before. Babcock supplemented its considerate language with a very courteous message he had been sent by General Grant, he said, to make any arrangement General Lee might desire for a conference, whether within the Union or within the Confederate lines. Grant already had offered, it will be remembered, to have the surrender arranged through officers designated for that purpose, in order that the Confederate leader might be spared humiliation, but Lee probably never thought of passing on to others this unpleasant task. He meant literally what he had said to Alexander, that he would go to General Grant and surrender himself and take the consequences of his acts. Marshall thought that Lee subconsciously was impelled to this personal surrender by reason of his father's unfavorable reference in his memoirs to Cornwallis's failure to appear on the day of the surrender at Yorktown. Making ready to proceed, Lee took from his breast pocket the folded map with which he had fought the campaign and gave it to Colonel Venable, who, a little later, burnt it. Lee questioned, also, whether the truce that had been granted would last long enough to cover the necessary interview. Babcock met this by writing in Grant's name a dispatch to Meade to continue the truce until further orders. On such a mission as he was now about to begin, Lee naturally would be accompanied by his adjutant general and by his military secretary, but Colonel Taylor had no heart for being present at a surrender. He begged off on the ground that he already had ridden twice through the lines that morning. Lee excused him with his usual consideration for the feelings of others. In the company of Marshall, Babcock, and Tucker, the daring orderly, Lee started up the road and beyond the thin and silent line of battle on the hillside. At the stream, Traveler wanted to drink. Lee waited until his faithful mount had his fill. Then he went on. How often he had ridden that strong steed and in scenes how various! Up Malvern Hill, when the very earth seemed alive with the crawling wounded, over Thoroughfare Gap while Stonewall's guns were growling, and after the spinning wheels of the pursuing guns at Second Manassas, across South Mountain, among the bloody ridges of the Antietam, with the mists enveloping him at Fredericksburg, confident and calm when the cheering thousands acclaimed him in the woods of Chancellorsville, out on the hill at Gettysburg, along the mournful byways of the wilderness, down. The telegraph road toward Cold Harbor, over the James, and over the same Appomattox, sullen and tawny, at Petersburg. Jackson had ridden with him, the battle light in his eyes, the laughing Stuart, the nervous Hill, the diligent Pender, the gallant Rhodes, all of them dead now, and he alone, save for those silent companions, was on his last ride as commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Thirty-nine years of devotion to military duty had come to this, and this, too, was duty. As the little cavalcade passed toward the village of Appomattox, Lee had to arouse himself and arrange the details, Grant had left it to him to select the place of meeting. Would Marshall go ahead and find a suitable house? 
Obediently, the colonel trotted off. Lee remained with Babcock. They did not talk, how could they, 69? After a while, the orderly returned to say that Colonel Marshall had found a room for the conference. Lee went on and, under the soldier's guidance, drew rein beyond the courthouse in the yard of a house on the left-hand side of the road to Lynchburg. The residence belonged to Major Wilmer McLean, who, by the oddest chance, had owned the farm on Bull Run where, in the first battle of that name, the initial clash had occurred. Major McLean had removed from that closed position and had purchased a property at Appomattox, only to find that the march of the armies he had sought to avoid was now about to end, as it had begun, at his door. Lee dismounted in the yard and after the orderly tip traveler, he walked toward the wide steps that led to the covered porch, which ran the whole width of the house. Entering the central hall, at the top of the steps, he turned into the front room on his left, a typical parlor of a middle-class Virginia home. Colonel Marshall went with him. Colonel Babcock accompanied Lee, also, with the explanation that as General Grant would soon arrive, the orderly could easily direct him to the place. Lee walked diagonally across the room and sat down close to a small table in the corner beyond the front window and farthest from the hall. He put his hat and gauntlets on the table, and there he waited. Babcock and Marshall remained in the room and, no doubt, seated themselves at his invitation. Half an hour passed, perhaps the longest half hour in Lee's whole life. If there was any conversation, it was in snatches and was slow, labored, and vague. About 1.30 o'clock there was a clatter in the road, the sound of the approach of a large body of mounted men. They drew nearer, they halted, they dismounted. Some of them climbed the steps. Babcock went to the door and opened it. A man of middle height, slightly stooped and heavily bearded, came in alone. He was dressed for the field, with boots and breeches mud bespattered. He took off his yellow thread gloves as he stepped forward. Lee had never seen him to remember him but he knew who he was and, rising with Marshall, he started across the room to meet General Grant. They shook hands quietly with brief greetings. Then Grant sat down at the table in the middle of the room and Lee returned to his place. Marshall stood to the left and somewhat behind him. Babcock had a few whispered words with Grant, then went from the room and out on the porch. He soon was back, followed by a full dozen federal officers, Sheridan and Ord among them. These newcomers arranged themselves behind Grant and in sight of Lee as quietly as boots and spurs and clanking swords permitted. Grant made no reference to their coming. Lee showed no sign of resentment at their presence. The conversation began, I met you once before, General Lee, Grant said in his normal tones, while we were serving in Mexico, when you came over from General Scott's headquarters to visit Garland's brigade, to which I then belonged. I have always remembered your appearance, and I think I should have recognized you anywhere. Yes, answered Lee quietly, I know I met you on that occasion, and I have often thought of it and tried to recollect how you looked, but I have never been able to recall a single feature. Mention of Mexico aroused many memories. Grant pursued them with so much interest and talked of them so readily that the conversation went easily on until the Federal was almost forgetting what he was about. Lee felt the weight of the moment and brought Grant back with words that seemed to come naturally yet must have cost him anguish that cannot be measured. I suppose, General Grant, he said, that the object of our present meeting is fully understood. I asked to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. Grant did not change countenance or exhibit the slightest note of exultation in his reply. The terms I propose are those substantially in my letter of yesterday, that is, the officers and men surrendered to be paroled and disqualified from taking up arms again until properly exchanged, and all arms, ammunition and supplies to be delivered up as captured property. Lee nodded an assent that meant more than his adversary realized. The phantom of a proud army being marched away to prison disappeared as Grant spoke, and the hope Lee had first expressed to Taylor that morning was confirmed. Those, said he, are about the conditions I expected would be proposed. Yes, Grant answered, I think our correspondence indicated pretty clearly the action that would be taken at our meeting, and I hope it may lead to a general suspension of hostilities and be the means of preventing any further loss of life. That, of course, was a theme that Lee's conception of his duty as a soldier would not permit him to discuss. 
It was his to obey orders and to direct the forces in the field. The civil authorities had the sole power, he held, to make peace of the sort General Grant had in mind. So he merely inclined his head again. Grant talked on of peace and its prospects. Lee waited and then, courteously, but in a manifest desire to finish the business at hand, he said, I presume, General Grant, we have both carefully considered the proper steps to be taken, and I would suggest that you commit to writing the terms you have proposed, so that they may be formally acted upon. Very well, I will write them out. Lee sat in silence and looked straight ahead as Grant called for his manifold order book, opened it, lit his pipe, puffed furiously, wrote steadily for a while with his pencil, paused, reflected, wrote two sentences, and then quickly completed the text. Grant went over it in an undertone with one of his military secretaries, who interlined a few words. Lee did not follow any of this. He sat as he was until Grant rose, crossed to him, and put the manifold book in his hands, with the request that he read over the letter. Lee probably was at his tensest then, for he busied himself with little mechanical acts as though to master his nerves. He placed the book on the table. He took his spectacles from his pocket. He pulled out his handkerchief. He wiped off the glasses, he crossed his legs, he set his glasses very carefully on his nose, and then he took up the order book for a slow, careful reading. Appomattox C. H. V. A. April 9, 1865 General R. E. Lee. Comte C. S. A. Gen. In accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th instant, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of N. Virginia on the following terms, to wit. Rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate the officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the. At this point, Lee turned the page and read on. Government of the United States until properly and each company or regimental commander sign a like parole for the men of their command. Lee stopped in his reading, looked up, and said to Grant, after the words until properly, the word exchanged seems to be omitted. You doubtless intended to use that word. Why, yes, answered Grant, I thought I had put in the word exchanged. I presumed it had been omitted inadvertently, and with your permission I will mark where it should be inserted. Certainly. Lee felt for a pencil, but could not find one. Colonel Horace Porter stepped forward and offered his. Lee took it, thanked him, placed the book on the table, inserted the carrot, and resumed his reading. The arms, artillery and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officer appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the side arms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. This done each officer and man will be allowed to return to their homes not to be disturbed by United States authority so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. Very respectfully. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant G.L. There was a slight change in Lee's expression as he read the closing sentences, and his tone was not without warmth as now he looked up at Grant and said, This will have a very happy effect on my army. Unless you have some suggestions to make in regard to the form in which I have stated the terms, Grant resumed, I will have a copy of the letter made in ink and sign it. Lee hesitated, There is one thing I would like to mention. The cavalrymen and artillerists own their own horses in our army. Its organization in this respect differs from that of the United States. I would like to understand whether these men will be permitted to retain their horses. You will find, answered Grant, that the terms as written do not allow this. Only the officers are allowed to take their private property. Lee read over the second page of the letter again. For months he had agonized over his field transportation and cavalry mounts. He knew what the army's horses would mean to the South, stripped as it had been of all draft animals, and he wanted those of his men who owned mounts to have them for the spring plowing. His face showed his wish. His tongue would not go beyond a regretful no, I see the terms do not allow it, that is clear. Grant read his opponent's wish, and, with the fine consideration that prevailed throughout the conversation, one of the noblest of his qualities, and one of the surest evidences of his greatness, he did not humiliate Lee by forcing him to make a direct plea for a modification of terms that were generous. 
well, the subject is quite new to me. Of course, I did not know that any private soldiers own their animals, but I think this will be the last battle of the war, I sincerely hope so, and that the surrender of this army will be followed soon by that of all the others, and I take it that most of the men in the ranks are small farmers, and as the country has been so raided by the two armies, it is doubtful whether they will be able to put in a crop to carry themselves and their families through the next winter without the aid of the horses they are now riding, and I will arrange it this way, I will not change the terms as now written, but I will instruct the officers I shall appoint to receive the paroles to let all the men who claimed on a horse or mule take the animals home with them to work their little farms. It could not have been put more understandingly or more generously. Lee showed manifest relief and appreciation. This will have the best possible effect upon the men, he said, it will be very gratifying and will do much toward conciliating our people. While Grant set about having his letter copied, Lee directed Marshall to draft a reply. In the wait that followed, Grant brought up and introduced the officers who had remained silent in the background. Lee shook hands with those who extended theirs and bowed to the others, but he spoke only to General Seth Williams, a warm friend during his superintendency at West Point. He talked to Williams without apparent effort, but when that officer introduced a pleasantry of the old days, Lee had no heart for it. He could not jest as his army was surrendering and his country dying. He only inclined his head ever so little at Williams's joke, and he did not smile. When Colonel Parker was presented, it seemed to Horace Porter that General Lee looked at him longer than at the others. It was Porter's belief that Lee thought the Indian a Negro and was surprised to find an African on Grant's staff. When the introductions were over, Lee turned again to Grant. I have a thousand or more of your men as prisoners, General Grant, a number of them officers whom we have required to march along with us for several days. I shall be glad to send them into your lines as soon as it can be arranged, for I have no provisions for them. I have, indeed, nothing for my own men. They have been living for the last few days principally upon parched corn and are badly in need of both rations and forage. I telegraphed to Lynchburg, directing several trainloads of rations to be sent on by rail from there, and when they arrive I should be glad to have the present wants of my men supplied from them. There was a stir among the listeners at this remark, and they looked at Sheridan, for, unknown to Lee, he had the previous night captured at Appomattox Station the rations that had come down from Lynchburg. Those that had been sent up from Farmville had been found by the Federals farther down the road. Grant did not add to Lee's distress by a recountal of these seizures. He merely said, I should like to have our men within our lines as soon as possible. I will take steps at once to have your army supplied with rations, but I am sorry we have no forage for the animals. We have had to depend upon the country for our supply of forage. Of about how many men does your present force consist? Lee reflected for a moment, indeed, I am not able to say. My losses in killed and wounded have been exceedingly heavy, and besides, there have been many stragglers and some deserters. All my reports and public papers, and, indeed, my own private letters, had to be destroyed on the march to prevent them from falling into the hands of your people. Many companies are entirely without officers, and I have not seen any returns for several days, so that I have no means of ascertaining our present strength. Grant had estimated Lee's numbers at 25,000 and he asked, Suppose I send over 25,000 rations, do you think that will be a sufficient supply? I think it will be ample, Lee is said by Horace Porter to have replied. And it will be a great relief, I assure you, he added instantly. Colonel Marshall's memory of Lee's answer was that he said 25,000 rations would be more than enough. General Sheridan then came forward and requested that he might copy two dispatches he had sent Lee that day, in such a hurry that he had not written them out for his records. These dispatches were protests against alleged violations of the truce. Lee took out the dispatches from his pocket and said he was sure that if the truce had been violated it was through a misunderstanding. By this time, Marshall had finished his draft of Lee's acceptance of Grant's terms of surrender. It began with a sentence which would indicate that the agreement had been reached by correspondence. Lee modified this because he thought it would create a false impression. He made, perhaps, a few other changes, and then he had Marshall copy the document. The Federals had borrowed Marshall's ink in order to write their answer, and now, Marshall, having no paper with him, had to procure some from their stock. 
The finished letter was now brought Lee and was read over by him. Lieutenant Gen. U. S. Grant. Commanding Armies of the United States. General, I have received your letter of this date containing the terms of surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia as proposed by you. As they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the 8th instant, they are accepted. I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulations into effect. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. Lee put his signature to this without a quiver. Marshall sealed it and went over to Parker, who already had Grant's letter waiting for him, duly signed and in an addressed envelope. They made the exchange and the surrender was complete. It was then about 3.45 p.m. The rest was casual and brief. Grant explained why he was without his sword. Lee is said to have remarked that he usually wore his win with the army in the field. Then Lee requested that Grant notify Meade of the surrender so that firing might not break out and men be slain to no purpose. He requested also that ending the actual surrender, the two armies be kept separate so that personal encounters would be avoided. Grant acquiesced immediately and suggested that time might be saved if two of his officers rode to Meade through the Confederate lines. Lee thereupon rose, shook hands with General Grant, bowed to the spectators and passed from the room. He went through the hall to the porch, where several federal officers at once sprang to their feet and saluted. Putting on his hat, Lee mechanically but with manifest courtesy returned their salute and with measured tread crossed the porch. At the head of the steps, he drew on his gauntlets and absently smote his hands together several times as he looked into space, across the valley to the hillside where his faithful little army lay. In a moment, he aroused himself and, not seeing his mount, called in a voice that was hoarse and half-choked, Orderly. Orderly! Quickly Tucker answered from the corner of the house, where he was holding Traveler's rein as the steed grazed. Lee walked down the steps and stood in front of the animal while the man replaced the bridle. Lee himself drew the forelock from under the brow band and parted and smoothed it. Then, as Tucker stepped aside, Lee mounted slowly and with an audible sigh. At that moment General Grant stepped down from the porch on his way to the gate, where his horse was waiting. Stopping suddenly, Grant took off his hat, but did not speak. The other Federals followed the courteous example of their chief. Lee raised his hat, without a word, turned his horse and rode away to an ordeal worse than a meeting with Grant, the ordeal of breaking the news to his soldiers and of telling them farewell. By no means all the men were prepared for the surrender. The rapidity of the retreat, the failure of rations, and the dwindling of brigades to companies had spelled disaster in the minds of the intelligent. The circle of fire reflected on the clouds the night of the 8th had convinced the discerning that the army was virtually surrounded. The halt of the morning and the frequent passage of flags of truce had confirmed their fears of capitulation. Yet such was the faith of the army in itself and in its commander that many were unwilling to believe the end had come. Lee came toward them, down from the ridge, across the little valley, up the hillside through the pickets, and into the line. He was as erect as ever, but he was staring straight ahead of him, with none of the cheerfulness and composure that usually marked his countenance even in the most dreadful moments of his hardest battles. The men started to cheer him, as they often did when he rode among them, but somehow their cheers froze in their throats at the sight of him. They hesitated a moment as he rode fixedly on, and then without a word they broke ranks and rushed toward him. General, they began to cry, are we surrendered? The question was like a blow in the face. He tried to go on, but they crowded about him, bareheaded. He removed his hat in acknowledgement and attempted once more to proceed. The road was too full of frenzied, famished faces. He had to halt and answer his loyal old soldiers. Men, he said, we have fought the war together and I have done the best I could for you. You will all be paroled and go to your homes until exchanged. Tears came into his eyes as he spoke. He attempted to say more but even his amazing self-mastery failed him. Moving his lips in a choking goodbye, he again essayed to ride onto the orchard from which he had come. General, we'll fight them yet, they answered. General, say the word and we'll go in and fight them yet. Everywhere as the news spread, each soldier reacted to it in his own fashion. 
some wept, openly and without abashment. Others were dazed, as though they did not understand how the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's army, could surrender. To Field's division, which had suffered little on the retreat, it seemed incomprehensible. To others, it was as the very end of the world. Blow, Gabriel, blow, cried one man, and threw down his musket as General Grimes told him what had happened. My God, let him blow, I am ready to die. Some blasphemed and some babbled, but all who could do so crowded to say farewell to Lee. Catching hold of his hands, they looked up at him and cried the more. They touched his uniform or his bridle rein, if they could not grasp his hand, and if they could not reach him, they smoothed traveler's flank or patted his neck. And in a confused roar, half sob, half acclamation, they voiced their love for him, their faith in him, their goodbye to him as their commander. Passing on slowly, agonizingly, he stopped at the apple orchard, where Talcott's engineers were still doing duty, and passed the cordon they had formed around the place. Lee saw Talcott among his men and had sufficient composure to tell the colonel what the terms were. Grant would soon send rations, he said. Talcott must keep his men together and must make them as comfortable as possible until they were paroled. Then Lee retired a short distance into the orchard away from the road, and there he began to feel the reaction. He could not sit down or rest, but kept pacing up and down under a tree. To one at least of those who watched him, Blackford of the engineers, he seemed in one of his savage moods. Blackford added, when these moods were on him it was safer to keep out of his way. The staff officers did not disturb him. He walked and turned and walked again and turned, battling with his own emotions. Presently, though the abandoned lines, there began to arrive federal officers, generally in groups of four or five. Some knew him and wished to greet him. Others were drawn by curiosity to gaze at the old lion, captured at last. They went to Taylor or to Venable, who had field headquarters under another tree, and asked to be presented to the general. Taylor brought them over. At their approach, Lee halted, drew himself up and stood at attention. He glared at them, according to Blackford, with a look few men but he could assume. They approached and took off their hats. He merely touched the rim of his hat in return and sometimes did not seem to Major Blackford to do even that. The interviews were all brief and manifestly not to his liking. In the hour of the supreme tragedy of his career as a soldier, Lee did not wish to see strangers or to be stared at, it mattered not with what deference. He probably had halted at the apple orchard to be accessible for the necessary business of the surrender, and he waited until the federal wagons had begun to arrive with the rations. It may have been while he was there that he received from Grant's headquarters a copy of the order appointing the three federal commissioners to arrange the details of the surrender. His own representatives, Longstreet, Gordon, and Pendleton, were named the same day, it is not known where or at what hour. The sun was now near its setting. The immediate duties were done. Lee mounted Traveler and started toward his headquarters, which were under a large white oak, about a mile to the rear. As he went, the scenes of his return from the interview with General Grant were repeated in heightened pathos. For now the whole army knew that the surrender had occurred, and most of the intelligent men had been given time to reflect what that act meant to him who was, in their eyes, both cause and country. There was, Blackford wrote, a general rush from each side of the road to greet him as he passed, and two solid walls of men were formed along the whole distance. Their officers followed, and behind the lines of men were groups of them, mounted and dismounted, awaiting his coming. As soon as he entered this avenue of these old soldiers, the flower of the army, the men who had stood to their duty through thick and thin in so many battles, wild, heartfelt cheers arose which so touched General Lee that tears filled his eyes and trickled down his cheeks as he rode his splendid charger, hat in hand, bowing his acknowledgments. This exhibition of feeling on his part found quick response from the men whose cheers changed to choking sobs as, with streaming eyes and many evidences of affection, they waved their hats as he passed. Each group began in the same way, with cheers, and ended in the same way, with sobs, all along the route to his headquarters. Grim, bearded men threw themselves on the ground, covered their faces with their hands, and wept like children. Officers of all ranks made no attempt to conceal their feelings, but sat on their horses and cried aloud. Traveler, 
took as much pleasure in applause as a human being and always acknowledged the cheers of the troops by tosses of his head and the men frequently cheered him for it, to which he would answer back as often as they did. On this, Traveller's last appearance before them, his head was tossing a return to the salutes all along the line. One man, extended his arms, and with an emphatic gesture said, I love you just as well as ever, General Lee. They thronged about him when he reached his headquarters, and when he dismounted all who were in sight of his camp hastened up. Let me get in, they began to cry. Let me bid him farewell. Lee stood with Long and Stevens and a few other old personal friends, and he sought to keep his composure, but as men after men crowded around him, each with warm words, his eyes filled anew with tears. In broken phrases, he told his veterans to go home, to plant a crop and to obey the law, and again and again he tried to say farewell. But they would not have it so. One handsome private, a gentleman in bearing, for all his dirt and rags, shook hands and said, General, I have had the honor of serving in this army since you took command. If I thought I were to blame for what has occurred today, I could not look you in the face, but I always try to do my duty. I hope to have the honor of serving under you again. Goodbye, General, God bless you. On the instant another gripped his fingers. Farewell, General Lee, he said, I wish for your sake and mine that every damned Yankee on earth was sunk ten miles in hell. This forthright profession relieved the strain. In the stir that followed, Lee lifted his hat once more in salute and went into his tent, to be alone. Chapter 10 The Final Bivouacs On the morning of April 10, 1865, rain was falling steadily, a rain that prepared Virginia fields for new planting, even though in the dark woods around Appomattox, along the red clay roads, it seemed to deepen the gloom that enshrouded the dead army. Lee went about the duties of April 10 calmly but with an occasional evidence of abstraction. He felt that he should prepare a report of the campaign, and he sent a circular to the court chiefs directing them to prepare brief accounts of their operations from March 29 to the present time. Longstreet and Gordon were to procure and to forward reports from the division commanders, including those who had been assigned to their corps after the retreat had begun. The only reference in this circular to the surrender was the statement of Taylor, who wrote it, that Lee wished the documents before the army is dispersed, that he may have some data on which to base his own report. Lee must have sent a somewhat similar circular to the principal officers of the general staff whom he directed to report the extent and condition of the supplies and equipment in their charge on April 8. About 10 o'clock Lee called for the draft of a farewell address to the army which he had instructed Marshall to write after the crowd had scattered and night had fallen on the 9th, when he had sat for a short time with some of his staff officers around a campfire outside his tent. The draft was not forthcoming. Marshall had been so occupied amid all the coming and going around the camp that he had found no time for the task. Lee told him to go into his ambulance, which had been drawn up near his headquarters tent, and to stay there until he finished the document. To make it certain that Marshall would not be interrupted, and to keep intruders away, Lee posted an orderly by the door of the ambulance. Soon there came word that General Grant had ridden over from the courthouse to call on him that he had been stopped and told he must wait until General Lee's instructions could be given the pickets who had been put out the previous day to prevent personal collisions among the men of the two armies. Chagrined at this display of a lack of proper consideration for a distinguished visitor, Lee immediately mounted Traveller. Wearing the uniform he had used the previous day, and wrapped in a blue military overcoat, he proceeded at a gallop to meet Grant. He found him on a little knoll to the right of the road to Lynchburg, just south of the North Fork of the Appomattox and between the lines of the two armies. As he approached, Lee lifted his hat, as did Grant. The officers who had attended the federal commander were equally polite and, after a moment, withdrew in a semicircle behind Grant, out of earshot. Grant began by telling Lee that his interest was in peace and in the surrender of the other Confederate armies. Lee replied that South was a large country and that the Federals might be compelled to march over it three or four times before the war was entirely ended, but the Federals could do this, he said, because the South no longer could resist. For his own part, he hoped there would be no further sacrifice of life, but he could not foresee the result. Thereupon Grant said there was no man in the South whose influence with the soldiers and with the people was as great as Lee's, and that if Lee would advise the surrender of all the armies he believed they would lay down their arms. Lee knew far better than Grant possibly could the weakness of the Confederate forces still in the field. 
Weeks before, he had told the Secretary of War that he did not believe the troops east of the Mississippi, outside the Army of Northern Virginia, could offer effective resistance. But Grant's proposal had to do with a question the president would have to decide, a question that Lee felt he could not urge on his own initiative. He promptly said that he could not advise the remaining Confederate armies without first consulting the president. Grant understood Lee's viewpoint and did not attempt to persuade him. Shifting the subject, Lee talked of the paroling of the army and asked that the instructions of the officers who were arranging the details of the surrender should be made so explicit that no misunderstanding could arise. Grant called up Gibbon, one of the commissioners, and gave assurance that this would be done. Then, as Lee was preparing to say farewell and to return to his lines, General Sheridan, General Rufus Ingalls, and General Seth Williams, who were anxious to have a closer look at the Army of Northern Virginia, asked General Lee if they might go over and call on some of their old Army friends. General Lee immediately consented and, after a little, lifted his hat once more to General Grant and rode off. The conversation had lasted more than half an hour and, according to Grant, was very pleasant. Lee did not see his adversary again until May 1, 1869, when he made a visit to Baltimore and stopped in Washington on his way home to call on Grant at the White House, where he had been advised the president would be glad to receive him. It is a curious fact that the two whose names are more closely linked than those of any two opponents in American history, Marshall and Jefferson not accepted, should have seen each other only four times, or perhaps five times, during their lives. General Lee was returning to his camp and was close to it when he met a cavalcade in blue and was greeted with a cheery good morning, General from a bearded man, who removed his cap as he spoke. For the moment Lee did not recognize the speaker, but the latter recalled himself as none other than George Gordon Meade, commanding the Army of the Potomac and an old friend of kindly days. But what are you doing with all that gray in your beard? Lee asked. You have to answer for most of it. Meade magnanimously replied. It was explained quickly that Meade had ridden over on a visit of courtesy and, not finding Lee at headquarters, was just starting back when he met him. Meade introduced his two aides, Colonel Theodore Lyman and Captain George Meade, his son. Lee shook their hands with all the air of the oldest blood in the world, according to Lyman. In manner, Lyman observed, Lee was exceedingly grave and dignified, this, I believe, he always was, but there was evidently added an extreme depression, which gave him an air of a man who kept up his pride to the last, but who was entirely overwhelmed. From his speech, I judge he was inclined to wander in his thoughts. As Lee and Meade rode toward the Confederate headquarters, the Greycoats began to cheer and to yell, as they had done whenever Lee had appeared that day. Unwilling to appear in a false light, Meade said to his color-bearer, who had the flag rolled up, unfurl that flag. Quickly the answer came from a cadaverous soldier by the roadside, damn your old rag. We are cheering General Lee. Lee invited Meade into his tent and chatted with him for some time. The talk was of the recent fighting and of the siege of Petersburg. As one professional soldier to another, Meade asked how many men Lee had in front of him on the morning of April 2. Lee replied that by the last returns he had 33,000 muskets. You mean that you had 33,000 men in the lines immediately around Petersburg? Meade said. Lee answered that the 33,000 were all he had on the whole line from the Chickahominy to Dinwiddie Courthouse. Meade expressed his surprise and said candidly that he had on the south side of the James over 50,000 men. Lee found consolation in knowing that he actually had fought against as heavy odds as he had supposed. After his visitor had left, Lee told Taylor and Long what Meade had said, and he inquired particularly of Taylor if his memory was correct and that he had only 33,000 infantry at the date of the last return. Taylor confirmed the figures. Later in the day Lee had another visitor in the person of the ablest of the Federal artillerists, General Henry J. Hunt. He found Lee weary and careworn, but in this supreme hour the same self-possessed, dignified gentleman that I had always known him. Lee conversed pleasantly with Hunt for half an hour until General Wise and, after him, General Wilcox, came in. The last named offered to accompany Hunt to the station of Long, who had been a lieutenant in Hunt's battery before the war. Lee had already informed Hunt where he might find his former subordinate. Long will be very glad to see you, he said, and he went on to tell what had befallen that officer. After dining frugally with his staff, 
Li had still other visitors and not a few routine duties. He received the formal terms of surrender as accepted by his commissioners and forwarded by Colonel Latrobe, and from Grant's headquarters he got a copy of the federal order under the terms of which paroled Confederates were to be allowed to pass through the federal lines and to travel free on government transports and military railroads in order to reach their homes. When Marshall had finished his penciled draft of the farewell order, Lee went over it, struck out a paragraph that seemed to him calculated to keep alive ill feeling, and changed one or two words. Marshall then wrote a revised draft, which he had one of the clerks at headquarters copy in ink. General Lee signed this and additional copies made by various hands for the corps commanders and for the chiefs of the bureaus of the general staff. Other individuals made copies of their own which they brought to General Lee to sign as souvenirs. This accounts for the multiplicity of originals, most of which are owned by persons who believe them the authentic first draft. As a matter of fact, there is no original. Marshall probably destroyed or misplaced the penciled text which General Lee revised. The language of the eliminated paragraph is not even known. An amended draft, in Marshall's autograph, is in the hands of his descendants, but cannot be affirmed positively to be the paper given by Marshall to the copyist. In hasty transcription and frequent reprinting the language of the order has assumed several versions. That which follows is from General Lee's letter book, into which it was copied, after Appomattox, by Custis Lee. H.D., QRS, Army of N.V.A. April 10, 1865. General Orders. Number 9. After four years of arduous service marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. I need not tell the brave survivors of so many hard-fought battles who have remained steadfast to the last that I have consented to this result from no distrust of them, but feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that could compensate for the loss that must have attended the continuance of the contest, I determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen. By the terms of the agreement, officers and men can return to their homes and remain until exchanged. You will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed, and I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you his blessing and protection. With an unceasing admiration of your constancy and devotion to your country, and a grateful remembrance of your kind and generous consideration for myself, I bid you all an affectionate farewell. S.G.D. R. E. Lee. G. E. N. L. The next day, April 11, Lee began to receive the reports of his subordinates. Some of them were hurried and perfunctory, but others were well considered. Those of the field officers concerned operations only. The general staff wrote in some instances of the problems of the retreat and confirmed Lee's judgment as to the necessity of surrendering when he did. General W. H. Stevens, the chief engineer, was most explicit. From a careful study of our position and resources, he wrote, the route pursued was the only one open to a chance of success, and I give it as my opinion that to have prolonged the effort to escape would have resulted in consequences frightful to contemplate and perhaps criminal to have ordered. The trains and army were surrounded, to have attempted to cut a passage would have resulted in a frightful loss of life, giving no results at all commensurate with such a loss. The report of the Chief of Ordnance, Lt. Col. B. G. Baldwin, showed to what a pitiful number of armed men the divisions had been reduced and how scanty was the ammunition available in Virginia for them and for the artillery. Mahone affirms that his men, to the very end, were well in hand and ready to give battle, but he revealed that from his command, one of the two divisions on which Lee had felt he could count as late as the morning of the 9th, 39 officers and 12 31 enlisted men were missing. Speaking of the army as a whole, straggling, said Stevens, from the start was frightful, a hackneyed but accurately descriptive adjective repeated several times in his report. With this material and doubtless with Marshall's assistance in the usual way, Lee set about preparing his own report. When completed, it was a document of some 1,200 words and was designed to be preliminary to a longer report that Lee then purposed to write. The only personal reference was in the opening sentence, it is with pain that I announce to your excellency the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. With no further preliminaries, he sketched operations from the arrival at Amelia Courthouse to the surrender. The outcome was attributed primarily to failure to find at Amelia the provisions he expected would be there. 
The army, he explained, had been forced to halt a day in order to seek food in the surrounding country. This delay, he said, was fatal and could not be retrieved. The nearest approach to blame for any individual was the statement, in reference to Sailor's Creek, that General Anderson, commanding Pickett's and B. R. Johnson's, became disconnected with Mahone's division, forming the rear of Longstreet. Proceeding then to the events that ended in the capitulation, he said of his action in accepting Grant's terms, I deemed this course the best under all the circumstances by which we were surrounded. On the morning of the 9th, according to the reports of the ordnance officers, there were 7,892 organized infantry with arms, with an average of 75 rounds of ammunition per man. The artillery, though reduced to 63 pieces, with 93 rounds of ammunition, was sufficient. These comprised all the supplies of ordnance that could be relied on in the state of Virginia. I have no accurate report of the cavalry, but believe it did not exceed 2,100 effective men. The enemy was more than five times our numbers. If we could have forced our way one day longer, it would have been at a great sacrifice of life, and at its end I did not see how a surrender could have been avoided. We had no subsistence for man or horse, and it could not be gathered in the country. The supplies ordered to Pamplin Station from Lynchburg could not reach us, and the men, deprived of food and sleep for many days, were worn out and exhausted. That was the closing sentence. This report is dated April 12, near Appomattox Courthouse, and it doubtless was finished and signed that morning. By the time it was completed Lee had said farewell to many of his officers, had given his autograph to some of them, had written his pledge not to take up arms against the United States until properly exchanged, and had signed Taylor's individual parole, the only one that required his personal attention. Taylor, as a, a G, had attested those of the other staff officers. As the paroling had begun on April 10, Lee might have started home that day. He never explained why he remained until the 12th, but doubtless he stayed because he did not wish to leave his men to bear without him the humiliation of stacking their arms and giving over their cherished old battle flags. He did not witness that sad ceremony on the morning of April 12, for it occurred out of sight of his camp and nearer Appomattox, but he did not break camp till the surrender was over and his tearful soldiers had turned away from the field of their last parade. There was no theatrical review, no speech-making, no pledge to keep the cause alive in loyal hearts. All that was behind Lee. Quietly and unceremoniously he left his last headquarters on the 12th and started home. With him rode Taylor, Marshall, and Cook, the last named sick and in an ambulance lent by the Federals. They took with them their headquarters wagon and General Lee's old ambulance, which Britt drove. Colonel Venables started with them but parted company very soon as his route to reach his family in Prince Edward County was different from theirs. Some federal officer, probably Gibbon, who was the senior Union general remaining at Appomattox, sent over a handsomely mounted escort of 25 cavalrymen to attend Lee to Richmond if he desired it. When Lee declined, the troopers still insisted on doing him the honor of accompanying him some distance from the camp. The worst of the strain was over now. Rest had begun to restore the nerves of the men, who had scarcely relaxed from the time they left Petersburg until they surrendered. They already had exhausted the fighting and its outcome as a theme of conversation, and as they went homeward through the budding trees, away from the sounds of rumbling wagon trains and marching columns, they talked freely and of many things, but little of the war. When Lee did speak of the struggle and its outcome, his thought, as always, was of those around him rather than of himself. He urged the young officers to go home, to take whatever work they could find, and to accept the conditions necessary for their participation in the government. The road they were following led northeastward from Appomattox to Buckingham Courthouse and thence eastward to Cumberland Courthouse, where it struck the old stage road from Lynchburg to Richmond by way of Farmville. As evening drew on, General Lee passed through Buckingham Courthouse, where he was identified and greeted. Two miles beyond the village he came, according to Lolly, to the bivouac of Longstreet, and there he decided to make his camp, in woods owned by Mrs. Martha Shepherd. Although his tent was speedily and quietly pitched, the coming of even so small a cavalcade attracted attention. Mrs. Shepherd learned who her visitor was and sent him an invitation to spend the evening at her home. For fear of inconveniencing her, he declined, precisely as he had scores of times during the war. 
If Lolly was correct in saying that Lom Street was camped in the same woods, the two spent their last evening together and parted the next day to meet no more, though they continued to correspond irregularly. Lom Street was bitter. Acknowledging that for months he had felt the southern cause hopeless, he affirmed that the next time he thought he would be sure it was necessary. If this remark came to Lee's ears he overlooked it. My interest and affection for you will never cease, Lee wrote Longstreet the next January, and my prayers are always offered for your prosperity. In some way, the news of Lee's coming spread ahead of him. Women hastened to cook provisions and brought them out to the road, where they waited for him. These good people are kind, too kind, he is reported to have said. Their hearts are as full as when we began our first campaigns in 1861. They do too much, more than they are able to do, for us. His only concern over food was about some oats he had procured for Traveller and was afraid someone else might take. As the day wore on, Traveller cast a shoe and became lame. Lee soon stopped at Flanagan Mill, Cumberland County, where he spent the night under the friendly roof of Madison Flanagan. The mount was shod that night and was ready for the road the next morning. On the 14th Major Cook, who was still sick, bade his chief farewell and turned off the road. Accompanied now only by Taylor and Marshall and the drivers, Lee continued on his way. Ere long he overtook one of his youthful veterans, limping barefooted along the same road. The boy had procured a mule at Appomattox, along with his parole, but had lost the animal when it had bolted from him. My boy, said Lee, you are too badly off for the long journey ahead of you, you have no shoes. I am going to spend the night at the home of my brother, Charles Carter Lee, who lives a few miles ahead at Pine Creek Mills. I will find you a pair of shoes, and you must stop there to get them. At evening, Lee reached his brother's farm in Powhatan County. He was made welcome, of course, but as the house was crowded he insisted on using his own tent. He was then invited to spend the night in familiar Virginia phrase at the residence of John Gilliam, whose farm adjoined that of C. C. Lee. He asked, instead, that the available room be given a sick officer and his wife, who had driven up. Learning from his brother's family that the Gilliams were disappointed at his refusal and were very anxious that he at least eat a meal at their table, he sent word that if it were agreeable he would take breakfast with them. Then, having procured a pair of shoes for the soldier to whom he had promised them, he went into camp, immediately in front of the Gilliam home. It was his final bivouac, the last night he ever slept under canvas. The next morning, he ate with the Gilliam family. It probably was at this time, and in answer to a question from Mr. Gilliam, that he said many people would wonder why he did not make his escape before the surrender, when that course was practicable. The reason, he explained, was that he was unwilling to separate his fate from that of the men who had fought under him so long. He was unrestrained in his conversation and made much of a little girl of about ten, the daughter of the Gilliams, who was presented to him. He took her on his knee and caressed her. Polly, he said, come with me to Richmond and I will give you a bow. The company was swelled that morning by the arrival of Rooney Lee and the general's nephew, John Lee. Riders and vehicles soon got underway, there were twenty horses altogether and went down the river road, through Powhatan and Chesterfield counties. As they neared the capital of the dying Confederacy, in the midst of a gloomy spring downpour, General Lee and two of his officers went ahead of the wagons and of the ambulance. Ere long they reached Manchester, which was then a separate municipality on the south side of James River, opposite Richmond. While the rain was at the heaviest he passed in the town the home of a Baptist minister who chanced to see the general, and later wrote of the scene in these moving words, his steed was bespattered with mud, and his head hung down as if worn by long traveling. The horseman himself set his horse like a master, his face was ridged with self-respecting grief, his garments were worn in the service and stained with travel, his hat was slouched and spattered with mud and only another unknown horseman rode with him, as if for company and for love. Even in the fleeting moment of his passing by my gate, I was awed by his incomparable dignity. His majestic composure, his rectitude and his sorrow were so wrought and blended into his visage and so beautiful and impressive to my eyes that I fell into violent weeping. To me there was only one where this one was. The streets through which General Lee rode in Manchester cut off his view of Richmond until he was close to the James River, which he had made renowned in military history. 
Then he could see how deep and how hideous were the scars on the face of the city. Both bridges were gone, a line of federal pontoons afforded the only crossing. Nearly the whole waterfront had been consumed in the fire of April 2-3 that had followed the evacuation. Arsenal, factories, flouring mills, tobacco warehouses, stores, dwellings, all were destroyed. On his left, in the middle of the stream, Bel El prison camp lay deserted. Beyond it, as his eyes swept across the river, the Tredegar ironworks was intact, but east of it were gaunt, blackened walls, the only sentinels over the once busy plants that had supplied him with shell and with small arms. Thence eastward, for nearly a mile, the fire had leveled the city from the north bank of the James to the hill beyond the business district. Scarcely a wall now stood shoulder high in the whole area, for safety had required the wrecking of those the flames and the fall of floors had left standing. The streets that had shown the proudest bustle in the days of the Confederacy now were mere track amid debris that had been hastily pushed back to the sidewalk to afford a passageway. They seemed to divide plots of tangled roofing and charred timbers in a garden of desolation. Above them, as boldly said as if the terraces of grey and black and red had been made for no other purpose than to display it, was the sharply cut façade of the Capitol that Jefferson had designed, the Capitol in which Hadan's statue of Washington stood, the Capitol where Lee himself had received command of the Virginia troops, the Capitol where Jackson's body had lain in state after Chancellorsville, the Capitol through whose corridors had run the defiant voices of the Confederate Congress. Swearing that the new nation should never know subjection and would never seek reunion. And now over its roof, in the easy pride of assured possession, the Union flag was flying. Against the grey sky of the dark April afternoon, above the waste and wretchedness of the city, that colourful flag must have seemed to dominate Richmond as the symbol of conquest. General Lee probably was forced to wait a while at the pontoon bridge, for his wagons and companions overtook him and followed him across the river and up the streets of Richmond. If there was a halt, General Lee did not prolong it an unnecessary minute, for he was anxious to avoid a demonstration of any sort. Rumor had spread on the 12th that he had arrived, but it had been ascertained then that the General Lee who had come to town was Custis, who had been carried as a prisoner of war from Sailor's Creek to City Point and had been allowed to visit his mother. Still, it had been the supposition of all loyal Confederates that Lee would return directly from Appomattox to his family in Richmond. A certain informal lookout for him had been kept. Now word spread quickly that he was riding uptown. As many as could reach Main Street before he passed, hurriedly turned out to see him. What met their gaze was not a pageant to stir martial ardor. He had put aside his best uniform and had on one that had seen long service, but he still wore a sword, though apparently not the handsome weapon he had carried at Appomattox. His mount was Traveler. With him now rode five others, Taylor, Marshall, and Rooney Lee among them. These officers also carried their side arms, but all their horses were gaunt and jaded. Behind them rattled the general's old ambulance and the wagons the Federals had permitted the officers to bring away from Appomattox for the transportation of their personal effects. In these vehicles, along with the possessions of the others, were General Lee's camp equipment and those of the headquarters records that had escaped destruction on the road to Appomattox. No attempt was made to dress up the vehicles for a formal showing. One of them, lacking a canvas, was covered with an old quilt. But those who looked at the sad little procession understood and choked and wept. Along a ride of less than a mile, from the pontoons to the residence at 707 East Franklin Street, the crowd grew thicker with each block. Cheers broke out, in which the Federals joined heartily. Hats went off, and uniform caps of blue along with them. General Lee acknowledged the greeting by uncovering repeatedly, but he was manifestly anxious to finish his journey as quickly as he could. Arriving in front of the house, he turned his horse over to one of the men attending the wagons. The heartbroken civilians of Richmond, widows, old men, maidens, thronged him as the soldiers had at Appomattox. They wanted to speak to him and to shake his hand, and if that was impossible, at the least to touch his uniform. He grasped as many outstretched palms as he could. In a moment, with his emotions strained almost to tears, he made his way to the iron gate and up the granite steps. Bowing again to the crowd, he entered the house and closed the door. The cheers of the crowd died out, and it began to scatter. His marching over and his battles done, Robert E. Lee unbelted his sword forever. 
Chapter 11, The Sword of Robert E. Lee Amid the deep shadows of some of the old tombs in Europe and cathedrals the observant traveler occasionally sees a sword that bears the marks of actual combat. Hacks and gaps there still remain, not made, like false staffs, to adorn a tale of pretended valor, but one in war when furious blade met challenging steel. No scratch was on the sword that General Lee laid away that April day in Richmond on his return from Appomattox. His weapon had never been raised except in salute. Rarely had it been even drawn from its scabbard. Yet it was the symbol of a four-year war, the symbol of an army and a cause. Where it had been, the red banners of the South had flown. About it all the battles of the Army of Northern Virginia had surged. As he puts it down, to wear it no more, the time has come, not to fix his final place as a soldier, but to give an accounting of his service to the state in whose behalf alone, as he had written on another April day, back in 1861, he would ever have drawn his blade in fratricidal strife. Had his sense of duty held him to the Union, as it held Winfield Scott and George H. Thomas, how much easier his course would have been. Never, then, after the first mobilization, would he have lacked for troops or been compelled to count the cost of any move. He would not have agonized over men who shivered in their nakedness or dyed the road with shoeless, bleeding feet. Well clad they would have been, and well fed, too. They would not have been brought down to the uncertain ration of a pint of meal and a quarter of a pound of Nassau bacon. The superior artillery would have been his, not his adversaries. On his order new locomotives and stout cars would have rolled to the front, swiftly to carry his army where the feeble engines and the groaning trains of the Confederacy could not deliver men. He would have enjoyed the command of the sea, so that he could have advanced his base a hundred miles, or two hundred, without the anguish of a single, choking march. If one jaded horse succumbed on a raid, the teeming prairies would have supplied two. His simplicity, his tact, his ability, and his self-abnegation would have won the confidence of Lincoln that McClellan lost and neither Pope, Burnside, nor Hooker ever possessed. He would, in all human probability, have won the war, and now he would be preparing to ride up Pennsylvania Avenue, as was Grant, at the head of a victorious army, on his way to the White House. But, after the manner of the Lees, he had held unhesitatingly to the older allegiance, and had found it the way of difficulty. Always the odds had been against him, three to two in this campaign, two to one in that. Not once, in a major engagement, had he met the Federals on even terms, not once, after a victory, had his army been strong enough to follow it up. To extemporize when time was against him, to improvise when supplies failed him, to reorganize when death claimed his best lieutenants, that had been his constant lot. From the moment he undertook to mobilize Virginia until the last volley rolled across the red hills of Appomattox, there had been no single day when he had enjoyed an advantage he had not won with the blood of men he could not replace. His guns had been as much outranged as his men had been outnumbered. He had marched as often to find food as to confound his foe. His transportation had progressively declined as his dependence on it had increased. The revolutionary government that he espoused in 1861 had been created as a protest against an alleged violation of the rights of the states, and it made those rights its fetish. When it required an executive dictatorship to live, it chose to die by constitutionalism. Fighting in the apex of a triangle, one side of which was constantly exposed to naval attack by an enemy that had controlled the waterways, he had been forced from the first to accept a dispersion of forces that weakened his front without protecting his communications. Always, within this exposed territory, his prime mission had been that of defending a capital close to the frontier. With poverty he had faced abundance, with individualism his people had opposed nationalism. Desperate as his country's disadvantage had been, it had been darkened by mistakes, financial, political, and military. Of some of these he had not been cognizant, and of others he had not spoken because they lay beyond a line his sense of a soldier's duty forbade his passing. Against other errors, he had protested to no purpose. From the first shot at Sumter, he had realized that the South could only hope to win its independence by exerting itself to the utmost, yet he had not been able to arouse the people from the overconfidence born at Bull Run. Vainly he had pleaded for the strict enforcement of the conscription laws, exempting no able-bodied man. Times unnumbered he had pointed out that concentration could only be met by like concentration, and that the less important points must be exposed that the more important might be saved. 
on the strategy of particular campaigns he had been heard and heeded often, on the larger strategy of full preparation, his influence had not been great, except as respected the first conscription act. Regarding the commissary he might as well not have spoken at all, because Mr. Davis held to Northrop until it was too late to save the army from the despair that hunger always breeds. Lee had himself made mistakes. Perhaps no one could have saved Western Virginia in 1861, but he had failed to recover it. With it the Confederacy had lost the shortest road to the Union Railway communications between East and West. In his operations on that front and during the seven days, he had demanded professional efficiency of an amateur staff and had essayed a strategy his subordinates had been incapable of executing tactically. After second Manassas, he had overestimated the time required for the reduction of Harper's Ferry. Longstreet had been permitted to idle away in front of Suffolk the days that might have been spent in bringing his two divisions back to Chancellorsville to crush the baffled Hooker. In reorganizing the army after the death of Jackson, Lee had erred in giving corps command to Ewell. Apart from the blunders of that officer and the sulking of Longstreet at Gettysburg, he had lost the Pennsylvania campaign because his confidence in his troops had led him to assume the offensive in the enemy's country before his remodeled machine had been adjusted to his direction. At Rappahannock Bridge he had misread the movements of the Federals, and in the wilderness, on the night of May 5, 6, 1864, he had left Wilcox and Haight in a position too exposed for their weary divisions to hold. Wrongly, he had acquiesced in the occupation of the bloody angle at Spotsylvania. Incautiously, that blusterous 11th of May he had withdrawn his artillery from Johnson's position. The detachment of Hampton and of Early, however necessary, had crippled him in coping with Grant when the Army of the Potomac crossed the James. He had strangely underestimated Sheridan's strength in the Shenandoah Valley, and he had failed to escape from Petersburg. Until the final retreat, none of these errors or failures, unless it was that of invading Pennsylvania so soon after the reorganization of the Army, affected the outcome of the war, but together they exacted of the South some of its bravest blood. Deeper still had been the defect of Lee's excessive amiability. When every hour of an uneven struggle had called for stern decision, he had kept all his contention for the field of battle. The action opened, he was calm but terse and pugnacious, the fighting ended, he conceded too much in kind words or kinder silence to the excuses of commanders and to the arguments of politicians. Humble in spirit, he had sometimes submitted to mental bullying. Capable always of devising the best plan, he had, on occasion, been compelled by the blundering of others to accept the second best. He had not always been able to control men of contrary mind. His consideration for others, the virtue of the gentleman, had been his vice as a soldier. Perhaps to this defect may be added a mistaken theory of the function of the high command. As he explained to Skybert, he believed that the general-in-chief should strive to bring his troops together at the right time and place and that he should leave combat to the generals of brigade and division. To this theory, which he had learned from Scott, Lee steadfastly held from his opening campaign through the Battle of the Wilderness. It was for this reason, almost as much as because of his consideration for the feelings of another, that he deferred to Longstreet at 2nd Manassas and did not himself direct the attacks of the Confederate right on July 2nd and 3rd at Gettysburg. Who may say whether, when his campaigns are viewed as a whole, adherence to this theory of function cost the army more than it won for the South? If this policy failed with Longstreet, it was gloriously successful with Jackson. If the failure at Gettysburg was partly chargeable to it, the victory at Chancellorsville was in large measure the result of its application. Not properly applicable to a small army or in an open country, this theory of command may have justified itself when Lee's troops were too numerous to be directed by one man in the tangled terrain where Lee usually fought. Once adopted where Wood's obscured operations, Lee's method could not easily be recast for employment in the fields of Pennsylvania. When Lee's inordinate consideration for his subordinates is given its gloomiest appraisal, when his theory of command is disputed, when his mistakes are written red, when the remorseless audit of history discounts the odds he faced in men and resources, and when the court of time writes up the advantage he enjoyed in fighting on inner lines in his own country, the balance to the credit of his generalship is clear and absolute. In three fast-moving months he mobilized Virginia and so secured her defense that the war had been in progress a year before the Unionists were within 50 miles of Richmond. 
finding the Federals, when he took command of the Army of Northern Virginia on June 1, 1862, almost under the shadow of the city's steeples, he saved the capital from almost certain capture and the Confederate cause from probable collapse. He repulsed four major offensives against Richmond and by his invasion of Pennsylvania he delayed the fifth for ten months. Ere the Federals were back on the Richmond line again, two years to the day from the time he had succeeded Johnston, Lee had fought ten major battles, Gaines's Mill, Fraser's Farm, Malvern Hill, 2nd Manassas, Sharpsburg, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, The Wilderness, and Spotsylvania. Six of these he had indisputably won. At Fraser's Farm he had gained the field but had not enveloped the enemy as he had planned. Success had not been his at Malvern Hill and at Sharpsburg, but only at Gettysburg had he met with definite defeat, and even there he clouded the title of his adversary to a clear-cut victory. During the twenty-four months when he had been free to employ open maneuver, a period that had ended with Cold Harbor, he had sustained approximately 103,000 casualties and had inflicted 145,000. Holding, as he usually had, to the offensive, his combat losses had been greater in proportion to his numbers than those of the Federals, but he had demonstrated how strategy may increase an opponent's casualties, for his losses included only 16,000 prisoners, whereas he had taken 38,000. Chained at length to the Richmond defenses, he had saved the capital from capture for ten months. All this he had done in the face of repeated defeats for the Southern troops in nearly every other part of the Confederacy. In explanation of the inability of the South to capitalize its successes, one British visitor quoted Lee as saying, The more, the Confederates, followed up the victory against one portion of the enemy's line, the more did they lay themselves open to be surrounded by the remainder of the enemy. Lee likened the operation to a man breasting a wave of sea, who, as rapidly as he clears a wave before him, is enveloped by the very water he has displaced. These difficulties of the South would have been even worse had not the Army of Northern Virginia occupied so much of the thought and armed strength of the North. Lee is to be judged, in fact, not merely by what he accomplished with his own troops, but by what he prevented the hosts of the Union from doing sooner elsewhere. The accurate reasoning of a trained and precise mind is the prime explanation of all these achievements. Lee was preeminently a strategist, and a strategist because he was a sound military logician. It is well enough to speak of his splendid presence on the field of battle, his poise, his cheer, and his manner with his men, but essentially he was an intellect, with a developed aptitude for the difficult synthesis of war. The incidental never obscured the fundamental. The trivial never distracted. He had the ability, who can say how or why? To visualize his fundamental problem as though it had been worked out in a model and set before his eyes. In Richmond, during May, 1862, to cite but one instance, he saw clearly where others saw but dimly, if at all, that Jackson's little army in the valley was the pawn with which to save the castle of Richmond. Once his problem was thus made graphic, he projected himself mentally across the lines to the position of his adversary. What was the logical thing, not the desirable thing from the Confederate point of view, for his opponent to do? Assuming that the Federals had intelligent leadership, he said, it is proper for us to expect, the enemy, to do what he ought to do. After he had studied the probabilities, he would turn to his intelligence reports. Prisoner's statements, captured correspondence, newspapers, information from his spies, dispatches from the cavalry outposts, all these he studied carefully, and often at first hand. Every stir of his enemy along the line he canvassed both for its direct meaning and for its relation to other movements. In assembling this information he was not more adept than many another capable general, and in studying it he was not more diligent, but in interpreting it he excelled. Always critical of the news that came from spies, few of whom he trusted, he was cautious in accepting newspaper reports until he learned which correspondents were close-mouthed or ill-informed and which were reckless or well-furnished with fact. When he discovered that the representative of the Philadelphia Inquirer, for example, knew what he reported and reported what he knew, he attached high importance to his statements. A credulous outpost commander received scant attention when he forwarded countryside rumor, but Stuart Sixth Sense Lee soon learned to appreciate, and when the tireless officer affirmed that the enemy was marching toward an objective he named, Lee rarely questioned it. The infantry were apt to move quickly in the hoofprints made by Stuart's returning courier. 
If Lee's strategy was built, in large part, on his interpretation of his intelligence reports, that interpretation was facilitated more by Stuart and Stuart's scouts than by anything else. Lee did not rely so much as has been supposed upon his knowledge of his adversaries. He knew that McClellan would be meticulous in preparation, and that Meade, making few mistakes himself, would be quick to take advantage of those of which he might be guilty. But these were the only federal generals-in-chief with whom he had been closely associated before the war. The others, save Grant, were in command for periods so brief that he scarcely knew them before they were gone. Grant's bludgeoning tactics and flank shifts he quickly fathomed, but he was progressively less able to combat them as his own strength declined. Whether it was the cooking of rations in the federal camps, coupled with verified troop movements on the Baltimore and Ohio, whether it was the ascent of transports on the James and the knowledge that McClellan would not renew his attack on Richmond until he felt himself strong enough to sustain the offensive, whether it was the gabble of deserters and a careful report of what Stuart himself had seen of dust clouds and covered wagons, whatever the information on which Lee acted, it was almost always cumulative. In nothing was he more successful as an analyst of intelligence reports than in weighing probabilities, discarding the irrelevant, and adding bit by bit to the first essential fact until his conclusion was sure. The movement from the wilderness to Spotsylvania was perhaps the most dramatic example of this method, but it was only one of many where Lee built up his strategy from information steadily accumulated and critically examined. Having decided what the enemy most reasonably would attempt, Lee's strategy was postulated, in most instances, on a speedy offensive. We can only act upon probabilities, he said, and endeavor to avoid greater evils, but he voiced his theory of war even more fully when he wrote, we must decide between the positive loss of inactivity and the risk of action. His larger strategy, from the very nature of the war, was offensive-defensive, but his policy was to seize the initiative wherever practicable and to force his adversary to adapt his plans thereto. If a fog of war was to exist, he chose to create it and to leave his opponent to fathom it or to dissipate it. Once he determined upon an offensive, Lee took unbounded pains to execute it from the most favorable position he could occupy. As far as the records show, he never read Bursit, but no soldier more fully exemplified what the master taught of the importance of position. The student can well picture Lee in his tent, his map spread on his table before him, tracing every road, studying the location of every town and hamlet in relation to every other and choosing at last the line of march that would facilitate the initial offensive and prepare the way for another. A monography of high military value might be based entirely on his use of the roads of Piedmont, Virginia and the gaps of the Blue Ridge, now to further his own strategic plan, now to block that of the enemy. All this might be termed the ground strategy of position. Of his great aptitude for reconnaissance and of the wise strategic employment, in combat, of ground that had been previously selected or occupied from necessity, enough has already been said in comment on particular campaigns. Lee's career does not prove that a soldier must be a great military engineer to be a great strategist, but it does demonstrate that if a strategist is an engineer as well he is doubly advantaged. If Lee on occasion seemed slow to his restless and nervous subordinates, it was because some unvoiced doubt as to the enemy's plan or his own best position still vexed his mind. For when his military judgment was convinced, he begrudged every lost hour. Herein was displayed the fourth quality that distinguished his strategy, namely, the precision of his troop movements, the precision, let it be emphasized, and not the speed nor always the promptness of the march. The army as a whole, under Lee's direction, could never cover as much ground in a given time as the Second Corps under Jackson or under Ewell. It was very rarely that the whole force completed, under pressure, what old Jack would have regarded as an average day's march. Usually, Lee had to ride with Longstreet to accomplish even as much as was credited to the slow-moving commander of the First Corps. Lee, however, could calculate with surprising accuracy the hours that would be required to bring his troops to a given position. This was true, also, of the various units in a converging movement unless the units were Longstreet's and were not operating under Lee's own eye. After the seven days campaign had acquainted him with his men and their leaders, Lee made only three serious mistakes in logistics. One of these was in the time required to occupy Harper's Ferry and to reconcentrate the army at Sharpsburg. The next was in calculating when the First Corps would arrive at Gettysburg, and the third was in estimating the hour at which that same corps would overtake a P. Hill in the wilderness. 
In two of these three instances, Lee based his advance on Longstreet's assurances, which were not fulfilled. Against these three cases of the failure of Lee's logistics are to be set his transfer of the Army of Northern Virginia to meet Pope, the movement down the Rappahannock to confront Burnside at Fredericksburg, the quick and sure detachment of Anderson and then of Jackson at Chancellorsville, the convergence of Hills and of Ewell's Corps at Gettysburg, the march from the wilderness to Spotsylvania, the shift to the North Anna, and thence to the Totopotomoy and to Cold Harbor and the careful. Balancing of force north and south of the James during the operations against Petersburg, the list is almost that of his battles. Had his mastery of this difficult branch of the art of war been his only claim to distinction as a soldier, it would of itself justify the closest scrutiny of his campaigns by those who would excel in strategy. His patient synthesis of military intelligence, his understanding employment of the offensive, his sense of position and his logistics were supplemented in the making of his strategy by his audacity. Superficial critics, puzzled by his success and unwilling to examine the reasons for it, have sometimes assumed that he frequently defied the rules of war, yet rarely sustained disaster in doing so because he was confronted by mediocrity. Without raising the disputable question of the capacity of certain of his opponents, it may be said that respect for the strength of his adversaries, rather than contempt for their abilities, made him daring. Necessity, not choice, explains this quality. More than once, in these pages, certain of his movements have been explained with the statement that a desperate cause demanded desperate risks. That might well be written on the title page of his military biography, for nothing more surely explains Lee, the commander. Yet if daring is an adjective that has to be applied to him again and again, reckless is not. Always in his strategy, daring was measured in terms of probable success, measured coldly, measured carefully. If the reward did not seem worth the risk, nothing could move him, except the knowledge that he had no alternative. In detaching Jackson for the march against Pope's communications, and in dividing his forces at Chancellorsville, examination of the circumstances will show that daring was prudence. In ordering Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, he felt that he had a fair chance of success if he attacked, and ran worse risks if he did not. The same thing may be said of the assault on Fort Stedman. From the seven days to Gettysburg, his daring increased, to be sure, as well it might, with his army performing every task he set before it, but the period after Gettysburg affords proof, almost incontrovertible, that he never permitted his daring to become recklessness. Throughout the spring and early summer of 1864, he felt, as he said on the North Anna, that he must strike a blow, but each time, save on May 5-6, his judgment vetoed what his impulse prompted. These five qualities, then, gave eminence to his strategy, his interpretation of military intelligence, his wise devotion to the offensive, his careful choice of position, the exactness of his logistics, and his well-considered daring. Midway between strategy and tactics stood four other qualities of leadership that no student of war can disdain. The first was his sharpened sense of the power of resistance and of attack of a given body of men, the second was his ability to effect adequate concentration at the point of attack even when his force was inferior, the third was his careful choice of commanders and of troops for specific duties, the fourth was his employment of field fortification. Once he learned the fighting power of his army, he always disposed it with the utmost care, so as to maintain adequate reserves, witness Fredericksburg. Only when his line was extended by the superior force of the enemy, as at Sharpsburg and after the wilderness, did he employ his whole army as a front-line defense. In receiving attack, he seemed to be testing, almost with some instrument of precision, the resistance of every part of his line, and if he found it weakening, he was instant with his reserves. Over and again, in the account of some critical turn of action, it is stated that the reserves came up rather accidentally than opportunely, and restored the front. Behind this, almost always, was the most careful planning by Lee. On the offensive, it was different. It is only by the concentration of our troops, he said in November, 1863, that we can hope to win any decisive advantage. He was writing then of the general strategy of the South, but he applied the same principle to every offensive. At Gaines's Mill and at Malvern Hill he early learned the wastefulness of isolated attacks, and thereafter, confident of the elan of his troops, it was his custom to hurl forward in his assaults every man he could muster, on the principle that if enough weight were thrown against the enemy, there would be no need of reserves. The final attack at 2nd Manassas and the operations of May 3rd at Chancellorsville illustrate this. 
Only when he was doubtful of the success of an assault, as on the third day at Gettysburg, did he deliberately maintain a reserve. In partial attacks he somehow learned precisely what number of men would be required, with such artillery preparation as he could make, and he rarely failed until the odds against him became overwhelming. For swift marches and for desperate flank movements, Lee relied on the Second Corps as long as Jackson lived, to receive the attack of the enemy he felt he could count equally on the first. Within the Corps, he came to know the distinctive qualities of the different divisions, and even among the divisions he graded the brigades. He was guided less in this, perhaps, by the prowess of the men than by the skill and resourcefulness of the different general officers. If danger developed unexpectedly in some quarter, his first question usually was, who is in command there, and he shaped his course according to his knowledge of the type of leadership he could anticipate. Whether that leadership was good or bad, Lee gradually developed fortifications to support it. The earthworks he threw up in South Carolina were to protect the railroad he had to employ in bringing up his army. Those built around Richmond, in June, 1862, were designed in part to protect the approaches from siege tactics and in part to permit of a heavy concentration north of the Chickahominy. The works were too light to withstand the continued hammering of siege guns, but, quickly constructed, they served admirably to cover his men and to discourage assault. They thus were midway between permanent fortifications of the old type and the field fortifications he subsequently employed. The same might be said of the works he constructed at Fredericksburg. His digging of trenches in the open field, while actively maneuvering, began with the first stage of the Chancellorsville campaign and was expanded at Mine Run. After May, 1864, when increasing odds forced him unwillingly to the defensive, he made the construction of field fortifications a routine of operations. The trenches, well laid, well sited, and supplied where possible with abatis, served both a strategical and tactical object. They were strategical in that they made it possible for him to detach troops for maneuver, they were tactical in that they enabled him successfully to resist a superior force with a steadily diminishing army. General Sir Frederick Maurice has held this to be Lee's major contribution to the art of war. As a tactician, Lee exhibited at the beginning of hostilities the weaknesses that might be expected of one who had been a staff officer for the greater part of his military career. Until he lost many of his most capable officers he held strictly to his theory of the function of the high command, that of bringing the troops together in necessary numbers at the proper time and place. Yet he continued to learn the military art as the war progressed, and of nothing did he learn more than of tactics. He overcame his lack of skill in the employment of his cavalry. In the end he was deterred from elaborate tactical methods only because, as he confided to Hill in their conversation at Snell's Bridge, he did not believe the brigade commanders could execute them. He was often desirous of delivering an attack perpendicular to the line of the enemy and of sweeping down the front. This was his plan for the Confederate right on the second day at Gettysburg, and it was often suggested to his mind thereafter, but it was never successfully executed on a large scale. His subordinates could not get their troops in position for such a maneuver. Almost invariably the attack became frontal. Predominant as was strategy in the generalship of Lee from the outset, and noteworthy as was his later tactical handling of his troops on the field of battle, it was not to these qualities alone that he owed the record he closed that day when he unbelted his sword after Appomattox. It had been as difficult to administer the army as to use it successfully in combat. Never equipped adequately or consistently well-fed after the early autumn of 1862, the Army of Northern Virginia had few easy marches or ready victories. Lee had to demand of his inferior forces, as he always affirmed the administration had to exact of the entire population the absolute best they could give him. The army's hard-won battles left its ranks depleted, its command shattered by death or wounds, its personnel exhausted, its horses scarcely able to walk, its transportation broken down, its ammunition and its commissary low. That was why its victories could not be pressed. Earnestly, almost stubbornly, he had to assert, the lives of our soldiers are too precious to be sacrificed in the attainment of successes that inflict no loss upon the enemy beyond the actual loss in battle. On him fell the burden of an endless reorganization that is as much a part of his biography as it is of his title to fame. Out of the wreckage of battle, time after time, he contrived to build a better machine. He did not work by any set formula in administering the army, but by the most painstaking attention to the most minute details. 
hungry men had to be restored by better rations, if the commissary could not provide them, he would seek them by raids or by purchases in the surrounding country, even if he had to send out details to thresh wheat and to grind it at the country mills. Rest was imperative, he would choose a strategically sound position where the troops could have repose without uncovering the approaches to Richmond. To select men to succeed the general officers who fell in action, he would confer with those who knew the colonels of the regiments and he would examine each officer's record for diligence, for capacity, and for sobriety. Had the men worn out more shoes than they had been able to capture from the enemy? Then he would present their plight to the administration and would continue writing till the footgear was forthcoming, or else he would organize his own cobblers, save and tend the skins of the animals the commissaries had slaughtered, and out of them would seek to make shoes that would keep his men, at least, from having to march barefooted over snowy roads. If state pride demanded that troops from the same area be brigade together and commanded by a native son, he might disapprove the policy, but he would shift regiments and weigh capabilities and balance fighting strength until the most grumbling congressman and the most jealous governor were satisfied. The very soap his dirty men required in the much of the Petersburg trenches was the subject of a patient letter to the president. His mobilization of Virginia, though it was among his most remarkable achievements and afforded sure evidence of his rating as an administrator, was equaled by the speed and success of his reorganization of the army after the seven days, after Sharpsburg, and after Gettysburg. One aspect of his skill in administration deserves separate treatment as a major reason for his long-continued resistance. That was his almost uniform success in dealing with the civil government, a sometimes difficult business that every military commander must learn. Although the front of his army may be where the general-in-chief can direct every move, its rear stretches back far beyond the most remote bureau of the War Department. Few generals are ever much stronger than their communications with the authorities that sustain them, and few are greater, in the long view, than the confidence they beget. Often and tragically, both North and South illustrated this maxim during the war between the states. It was by the good fortune of former association that Lee had the esteem of President Davis, it was by merit that he preserved that good opinion, by merit plus tact and candor and care. During the war, General Lee received a few sharp messages from Mr. Davis, and he must have known him to be nervous, sensitive, and jealous of his prerogatives, yet it cannot be said that Lee found Davis a difficult man with whom to deal. This was because Lee dominated the mind of his superior, yet applied literally and loyally his conviction that the president was the commander-in-chief and that the military arm was subordinate to the civil. He reported as regularly to the president as Stuart or Jackson, those model lieutenants, reported to him. Reticent toward his own staff about military matters, he rarely made a move without explaining his full purpose to the president in advance. In judgment, he always deferred to Mr. Davis. The detachment of troops frequently diminished the army's power of resistance and sometimes threatened its very life, but Lee usually closed his reasoned protest with the statement that if the executive thought it necessary to reduce the forces under his command, he would of course acquiesce. Although he was entrusted with the defense of the capital of the Confederacy and had constantly to seek replacements, Lee never put the needs of his army above those of the Confederacy. Steadfastly he worked on the principle he thus stated, if it is left to the decision of each general whether he will spare any troops when they are needed elsewhere, our armies will be scattered instead of concentrated, and we will be at the mercy of the enemy at all points. He never vexed a troubled superior by magnifying his difficulties. If, to the unsympathetic eye, there frequently is a suggestion of the courtier in the tone of Lee's letters to the president, it was because of Lee's respect for constituted authority. Dealing with four secretaries of war in order, Walker, Benjamin, Seddon, and Breckinridge, Lee encountered little or no friction. Benjamin was reputed to be the most exacting of them all in that he was charged with desiring to dictate the strategy as well as to administer the department. Johnston's friends have said if that officer had not forced the issue with Benjamin, no other general in the field would have been free to command his army. Lee had no occasion to fear this would be so. His relations with Benjamin, though never close, were consistently pleasant. To each of the secretaries Lee reported and before each of them he laid his difficulties. Usually he was candid with them as to his plans, so much so, indeed, that often if a letter were not addressed to the Honorable Secretary of War, one would think it were intended for the confidence of the President. Only when important moves were afoot and secrecy was imperative was Lee ever restrained in addressing the War Office. 
Increasingly as the emergencies demanded, Lee addressed directly the administrative heads of the bureaus of the War Department, without reference to the secretary, but in so doing he escaped clashes with their superior. Colonel Northrop, of course, was a thorn in his flesh. In correspondence with him Lee was always courteous and always restrained. In a long controversy over the impressment of food from farmers, Lee simply held his ground in the face of all the arguments of Colonel Northrop. Sometimes, when the commissary general insisted that rations be reduced, Lee ignored the suggestion and, from available supplies, fed his men what he considered necessary to restore their vitality or to maintain their health. This provoked complaining endorsements by Northrop on papers meant for the president's eye, but it brought Lee no rebuke from Mr. Davis. Northrop was Lee's one outspoken critic in the administration. Most of the others were his open admirers. With Congress, Lee had little directly to do. Perhaps it was fortunately so. He often captivated politicians, and at one time, it will be remembered, he virtually acted for the administration in dealing with that difficult and positive individual, Governor Zebulon Vance of North Carolina, but Lee had seen too much of Congress in Washington to cherish any illusions regarding it in Richmond. He had, in fact, an ineradicable distrust of politicians. Although he rarely broke the bounds of his self-imposed restraint, he was convinced that Congress was more interested in the exemptions than in the inclusions of the conscript laws. In the winter of 1864-1865, he thought the lawmakers were playing politics when the existence of the Confederacy depended upon the enlistment of every able-bodied man. His outburst in his conversation with Custis Lee, after his conference with the Virginia delegation in Congress, revealed many things that he had long felt but had not said. Next in order, among the reasons for Lee's success as a soldier, is probably to be ranked his ability to make the best of the excellencies and of the limitations of his subordinate officers. Thanks to the President's understanding of the need of professional training for command, and thanks, also, to the wisdom of his own early selections, Lee had some of the best graduates of West Point among his officers. He saw to it that such men held the posts of largest responsibility. At one period of his warring, a council of his corps and divisional commanders would almost have been a reunion of alumni of the military academy. Yet these officers were not all of them outstanding in ability, nor were they sufficient in number to command the divisions, much less the brigades. Even when he availed himself of the well-schooled former students of the Virginia Military Institute and of like schools in other states, he had to entrust the lives of many thousands of his men to those who had received no advanced training in arms prior to 1861. Along with the individual jealousies, ambitions, and eccentricities that had to be encountered in every army, he had to cope with political generals and with those who had a measure of class antagonism to the professional soldier. Perhaps Lee's most difficult labor was that of taking a miscellaneous group of Southern individualists, ranging in capacity from dullness to genius, and of welding them into an efficient instrument of command. No commander ever put a higher valuation on the innate qualities of leadership. It is, he wrote, to men, of high integrity and commanding intellect that the country must look to give character to her counsels. He was not quick to praise, but he was sparing in criticism. When he offended the amor propra of any officer, he made amends. Unless a man was grossly incapable, he was slow to relieve him of command. He preferred to suffer the mediocrity he knew than to fly to that of which he was not cognizant. If a general was disqualified by slowness, by bad habits, or by obtuseness, Lee sought quietly to transfer him to a post where his shortcomings would be less costly. In some instances, perhaps, officers did not know that they owed their change of command to the fact that Lee had weighed them and had found them wanting. Indecision, notorious ill-temper, intemperance, and a pessimistic, demoralizing outlook were the qualities he most abhorred in a soldier. I cannot trust a man to control others who cannot control himself, he said, and, in the saying, explained why some men of capacity, even of brilliance, never rose high in the army or remained long with it. For personal cowardice, he had a soldierly scorn, but he rarely encountered it. There was only one brigadier general in his army, and none above that grade, concerning whose personal courage in the presence of the enemy there ever was serious question. Lee would listen patiently to suggestions from any quarter, even when they were given by those who seemed disposed to usurp his function as commanding general, and he was always patient in dealing with personal idiosyncrasies unless they touched his sense of honor and of fair play. 
Whatever the station of an officer, Lee endeavored to see that full justice was done him, though he avoided personal dealings, if he could, with those who had no merit with which to sustain their grievances. Except perhaps in the case of Longstreet, the more a soldier was capable of doing, the more Lee demanded of him. Never brusque and less with extreme provocation, Lee was least suave and most exacting in dealing with those whose conception of duty he knew to be as high as his own. Once he got the true measure of Jackson, he would have considered it a reflection upon that officer's patriotism to bestow soft words or to make ingratiating gestures. He had a personal affection for the praise-loving Stuart, but he rarely put flattery or flourishes into his letters to that remarkable man. Yet when a dull brigadier or a stupid colonel came to his quarters, Lee did his utmost to hearten him. For young officers, he always had kind words and friendly, considerate attention, except when it was manifest that they needed a rebuke. If he had nothing else to give an exhausted lieutenant who brought dispatches through the burning dust of a July day, he would proffer him a glass of water in the same tones he would have employed in addressing the president. Although he realized that a trained and disciplined officer's corps was the greatest need of the army, he was almost alone among the higher commanders of the Confederacy in realizing that the volunteer leaders of a revolutionary force could not be given the stern, impersonal treatment that can be meted out to the professional soldiers of an established government. How different might have been the fate of Bragg and perhaps of the Confederacy if that officer had learned this lesson from Lee. Lee's social impulses aided him in dealing with his officers. He kept a frugal table as an example to the army, and he entertained little, but he was an ingratiating host and a flawless guest. Mindful of the amenities, he never failed to show captivating courtesies to the wife of any officer of his acquaintance when she visited the army. His calls were always prompt and cordial, and in talking to the wife he usually had more kind things to say of the husband than he ever voiced to the soldier in person. If grief came in the loss of a child, he was among the mourners. When a general was wounded, his were the most encouraging words to the alarmed wife. At every review held in the season when the ladies of the army might visit it, he personally arranged that they should witness the ceremonies from a point of vantage, and usually he rode over to speak to them. His subordinates respected him for his ability and his rectitude, their wives made them love him. All that can be said of Lee's dealings with his officers as one of the reasons for his success can be said in even warmer tones of his relations with the men in the ranks. They were his chief pride, his first obligation. Their distress was his deepest concern, their well-being his constant aim. His manner with them was said by his lieutenants to be perfect. Never ostentatious or consciously dramatic, his bearing, his record of victories, his manifest interest in the individual, and his conversation with the humblest private he met in the road combined to create in the minds of his troops a reverence, a confidence, and an affection that built up the morale of the army. And that morale was one of the elements that contributed most to his achievements. The men came to believe that whatever he did was right, that whatever he assigned them they could accomplish. Once that belief became fixed, the Army of Northern Virginia was well-nigh invincible. There is, perhaps, no more impressive example in modern war of the power of personality in creating morale. More than one writer has intimated that Lee's forbearance in dealing with Longstreet showed him too much of a gentleman to be a commander of the very first rank. It would be well for these critics to remember that the qualities of a gentleman, displayed to those in the ranks, contributed to far more victories than Longstreet ever cost Lee. The final major reason for Lee's successes in the face of bewildering odds is akin to the two just considered. It was his ability to maintain the hope and the fighting spirit of the South. The confidence aroused by the first victory at Manassas sustained the South until the disasters at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Thereafter, for a season, the belief was strong that Europe's need of cotton would bring recognition and intervention. As months passed with no hopeful news from France or from England, while the Union forces tightened their noose on the Confederacy, the Southern people looked to their own armies, and to them alone, to win independence. Vicksburg fell, the Confederacy was cut in twain. The expectations raised by the victory at Chickamauga were not realized. The Army of Tennessee failed to halt the slow partition of the seceded states. Gradually the South came to fix its faith on the Army of Northern Virginia and on its commander. Elsewhere there was bickering and division, in Virginia there was harmony and united resistance. 
The unconquered territory was daily reduced in area, but on the Rapidan and the Rappahannock there was still defiance in the flapping of each battle flag. The Southern people remembered that Washington had lost New York and New England, Georgia and South Carolina, and still had triumphed. Lee, they believed, would do no less than the great American he most resembled. As long as he could keep the field, the South could keep its heart. So, when the despairing were ready to make peace and the cowardly hid in the swamps or the mountains to escape the conscript officer, the loyal Confederate took his last horse from the stable for his trooper's son and emptied his barn of corn in order that Lee's army might not starve. Morale behind the line, not less than on the front of action, was sustained by Lee. Conversely, he could count upon a measure of popular support that neither the President, the Congress, nor any other field commander could elicit. The qualities that created this confidence were essentially those that assured Lee the unflagging aid of the President, the loyalty of his lieutenants, and the enthusiastic devotion of his men. But the order in which these qualities were esteemed by the civil population was somewhat different. Mr. Davis and the Corps commanders knew that Lee was better able than any other Southern soldier to anticipate and to overthrow the plans of the enemy, the men in the ranks were satisfied he would shape his strategy to defeat the enemy with the least loss to them. The people in the Southern towns and on the farms of the Confederate states saw, in contrast, a series of military successes they were not capable of interpreting in terms of strategy or tactics. They understood little of all the subtle factors that entered into army administration and into the relations of commander with president and with soldiers. But for them, the war had taken on a deeper spiritual significance than it had for some of those who faced the bloody realities of slaughter. In the eyes of the evangelicals of the South, theirs was a contest of righteousness against greed, a struggle to be won by prayers not less than by combat. They saw in Lee the embodiment of the faith and piety they believed a just heaven would favor. A war that would make a partisan of God works other changes no less amazing to the religious concepts of a nation, and among the Southern people, during the last year of the struggle, it lacked little of lifting Lee to be the mediator for his nation. The army, seeing him in battle, put his ability first and his character second. The civilian population, observing him from afar, rated his character even above his ability. These, then, would seem to be the signal reasons why Lee so long was able to maintain the unequal struggle of a confederacy that may have been foredoomed to defeat and extinction. To recapitulate, the foundation stone of his military career was intellect of a very high order, with a developed aptitude for war. On that foundation his strategy was built in comprehensive courses. Visualizing a military problem with clarity, he studied every report that would aid in its solution. If it were possible, he put his solution in terms of the offensive. With care he would select his position, with skill he would reconnoiter it, with precision of logistics he would bring his troops to it, and with daring he would engage them. For every action he sought to concentrate adequately, and for every task he endeavored to utilize the lieutenant best suited. In combat, however excellent his constantly improving tactics, he begrudged the life of each soldier he had to expose, yet he hurled his whole army into the charge, sparing not a man, when his daring gave him an opening for a major blow. As his numbers diminished and he was forced to the defensive, he perfected a system of field fortification that had a strategic, no less than a protective value. A diligent army administrator, self-controlled and disciplined in his dealings with his superiors, he chose his subordinates wisely and treated them with a justice that Washington himself could not have excelled. He had, besides, a personality and a probity that combined with his repeated victories to gain for him the unshakable confidence of his troops and of the civil population. The tactics he employed in the 1860s belonged to the yesterday of war, but the reasons for his success remain valid for any soldier who must bear a like burden of responsibility, whether in a cause as desperate or where the limitless resources of a puissant government are his to command. When the story of a soldier is completed, and the biographer is about to leave the last campfire of a man he has learned to respect and to love, he is tempted to a last word of admiring estimate. May he not, by some fine phrase, fan into enduring flame the spark of greatness he thinks he has discovered in the leader whose counsels he has in spirit shared? May he not claim for him a place in the company of the mighty captains of the past? Yet who that reverences historical verities can presume to say of any soldier who rises above the low shoulders of mediocrity, in this he outshone or in that he rivaled another who fought under dissimilar conditions for a different cause in another age? 
circumstance is incommensurable, let none essay to measure men who are its creatures. Lee's record is written in positive terms, why invoke comparatives? The reader who can appraise the conditions under which he fought can appraise the man. Others need not linger at the door or watch him take off his sword, or strain to hear the words he spoke to Mrs. Lee in the first moment of their meeting.